the room, so I'm going to get the meeting underway. Oh, sorry, I can't because it's one, one, minute, one minute to go. So counting down to one minute before we um, turn on the live stream. Thank you. Pauline, if you could begin the meeting with the parakeet. Kia ora. Whakataka te hoa ki te uru, whakataka te hoa ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tāra tāra ki tai. E hi aki ana te atakura, he te o hi huka, hi ho hu, te he Māori ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, now, I have... Um, no apologies at this stage, although there may be for early departure from uh, James. Yani, unsurprisingly, and, for lateness. Oh, Yani is an uh, apology for late arrival. Um, right, so uh, would someone like to move those two? Um, Melanie seconded uh, by Jimmy Chen. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. I've got declarations of interest. Um, Councillor Goff for public excluded item 28 and I've got uh, Tim Scandrit for uh, um, the uh, item in the Mayor's report that relates to venues Otatahi. Um, thank you. Uh, the, uh, we'll move on to public participation and we come to the public forum first and I have the uh, pleasure of inviting St John's Christchurch um, to come uh, to the table, Alice Earnshaw um, Morris, I believe, is representing St John today. Thank you so much for uh, coming here today and uh, making the presentation. Thank you for all you do in the community. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, you'll need to turn your microphone on. And you can sit down if you wish. I tend to bounce around a little bit. That's so fine. <laughs> bounce around. Um, so apologies. So. I am Alice. I am the Area Executive Manager for St John Christchurch. I also, as you can tell from the green uniform, uh, someone who turns up on the ambulances from time to time. So today I'm going to talk to you about what we do in the community um, and what I would like from you as councillors. So the reason I'm here today is because we are the provider of one of three primary emergency services in, in Christchurch but we are also the provider of a huge number of community health initiatives and services that tend to fly under the radar. So um, what I'm actually here to do today is to ask each and every one of you, from your mirror right down, I want to build relationships with you. I want to find out what is missing in your communities, what we could be doing better in your communities. Each of your pieces of Christchurch has really different needs and requirements. I will add a small caveat here. I'm used to giving this presentation over about an hour. So I'm about to power talk at you. Um, so apologies. Um, look, internationally, we're a huge organisation. We're approaching our 1,000th birthday. We have a medieval history that quite literally includes the Knights Hospitallers. Um, and right the way through to the fact that we used to have an island of Malta. You may have heard of it in the middle of the Mediterranean. That's why we actually have the Maltese Cross. Um, we lost that uh, in a siege uh, with our, our favourite French villain, Napoleon. Um, and then, <laughs> way back. Look, we fell into abeyance for a little bit there. Uh, we came back again under Queen Victoria, um, which is why we actually now have the Regnal Animals on our signa insignia as well. This is the only organisation I have ever worked for that has two lions and two unicorns on its logo. Look, the order of New, in New Zealand actually started here in Christchurch, so we are incredibly proud of our roots here in Christchurch. We started down at uh, a hall off the side of St Mary's Church in Merivale. Now that's now known as All Souls. It's still there, we're still connected to it. We still have very strong ties into that community. But we started off teaching first aid training. We had nothing to do with ambulances at all. Christchurch back in 1885 uh, had a paucity of medical practitioners, so we were teaching people how to look after themselves. We are an NGO, which is sort of an odd historical discrepancy, I guess, when it comes to providing one of your three major emergency services. But look, it is what it is, and as I talk through, you'll understand why that sometimes works in our favour. 
I will also point out we're a rather passionate bunch. 40% uh, of our paid staff across the country also hold at least one volunteer role. I myself hold two volunteer roles within the organisation, which means essentially I have no life anymore um, because I'm either on the ambulances, at events, or in my day job. Right, so I'll start with what you do know about us. This is the emergency ambulance service. We actually have three ambulance services in Christchurch. People are only aware of the one and think it's all one. So in Christchurch, I've got three stations, the hub and nine spokes. The spokes look like houses. They are signposted, but they're very hard to find. The reason for that is they are not manned stations. This is not somewhere you can go and find help, but they are scattered across the city. The important piece for this conversation here, though, is the fact that I only have 15 vehicles across the city for emergency ambulance services. Um, I run 11 of them in the day, six at night. These vehicles get run really hard. We're almost running them 24 seven, which means I have a small allowance in there for taking them off the road for servicing, um, maintenance, crashes, you name it. Um, when you're putting that number of vehicles out on the road constantly, things do happen, um, but we also run them incredibly hard. You'll note there that I have 140 volunteers who are on the ambulances in Christchurch. It's 140 people in your community who volunteer their time and energy to go and help people. They have the same qualifications, the same uh, ATPs, uh, if you know what authority to practice is with nursing staff, for example, they do the same. Our volunteers have the same qualifications, the same experiences, they just do it for free. And they're on key to what we do. Look, our event ambulances is another team that we have. These guys are static. They're the ones who turn up to rugby games, to cricket games, to music concerts, to wild food, uh, wine and food. <laughs> wrong city there for a second. <laughs> um, these guys are static. They, if something goes wrong at that event, they can't up and leave and take someone to hospital. They will provide first level care and they will call the emergency ambulance guys to come in and pick them up and take them. So every time we run an event, for example, um, Electric <coughs> Avenue a few weeks back, if something goes horribly wrong at that event, someone gets very sick, we need to take them to hospital, we are pulling emergency ambulances, one of those 15 vehicles, off the road to come and pick that up and take them. The third ambulance crew that we have uh, in Christchurch is a weird one. Uh, look, it's a team of specialist staff who deal with transferring patients between facilities. So this is post people who have had post-surgery, who are going from Christchurch Hospital to Burwood for rehabilitation, or the other way around if surgery at, at Burwood did not go according to plan, we need them back into Christchurch Hospital, or coming from one of our private facilities into Christchurch, into Christchurch Hospital as well. Um, just so you know that that exists, they do look quite different. Look, in terms of our funding, we are currently 78% funded by central government. That's through contracts with Ministry of Health and ACC. I am going to be incredibly clear with you, that 78% is only for the emergency ambulance service. Not the other two. Anything else that I talk about after this point is not covered by that funding. So we are less than 80% funded to provide our ambulance service. The bulk of the shortfall comes through uh, donations from the community. We're running annual appeal this week. We will be shaking buckets to buy ambulances and pay for staff uh, tomorrow and Saturday. Please give to us. We really need it. Right, things you don't know about us. We run youth divisions in Christchurch. We have 500 cadets. These are kids from six years of age through to 18. I run 11 groups in Christchurch to do this. This is essentially a youth program, the cheapest one you'll find in the country. Um, but this is essentially life skills, leadership skills, and a very generous helping of health. Um, a lot of our kids move into uh, medical professions of some sort, whether it's allied health, paramedicine, or uh, going to be doctors and surgeons. This is a great starting point for them. We're also cradle to grave. Uh, we don't actually get rid of our staff once they leave. We have a social and service group for retired staff. My eldest member is 92 in Christchurch. George has given 79 years of service to the organisation and to your communities, uh, and he is still active. It's really impressive. Um, but we don't drop them. We keep this as part of a prevention of social, social isolation. Uh, these people stay with us um, and continue to provide service to the community. 
Moving on, community care, things that you may have seen us do. Um, we have volunteers in the emergency department at Christchurch Hospital. These guys provide the caring support that the ED staff cannot. So ED are busy there trying to stop you vomiting, patch up the bleeding, all the rest of it. Um, <coughs> our volunteers in there actually say, are you all right? You've been here for four hours now with your mum. Do you need a cup of tea? Is your mum cold? Does she need a blanket? They can do the personal caring that the ED staff simply don't have time for, and we don't expect them to have time for that. And, I've got, and there I've also got them in paediatrics. I'm about to start in the next couple of months in New Zealand first of having these volunteers in our intensive care unit as well at the request of the Canterbury District Health Board. So we'll be moving through for that. We also run Caring Caller. This picked up uh, dramatically over um, COVID, obviously. This is a social isolation phone-based service where we match people up and provide friendship. Therapy pets, this is starting, that's Moose. Uh, Moose no longer works for us, but he's a very cool dog. Um, we've, this is a growing service. We're currently in aged eight, five aged care facilities in Christchurch. Our wait list for this is bigger than we can uh, match at the moment. But this is essentially just another recruitment drive for volunteers and their dogs. This goes through an amazing process to sort out the wheat from the chaff before we let them go anywhere. Um, but this is essentially friendship pets. Um, we'll be moving into primary schools to help with uh, reading programs as well for children. Right, AS, thinking of schools, ASB in schools, we teach children to save lives from uh, when they are early childhood education through to CPR in high schools. These programs started as a pilot program, an initiative here in Christchurch, and is now rolled out uh, nationwide. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, lives saved by our kids. Um, we're just extending this at the moment. We started off focusing purely on CPR processes. We're now teaching them how to recognise strokes and react to that as well through the FAST uh, acronym. Thinking of kids in schools, we are also starting uh, to work on mental health and mental wellbeing. This is a particular programme that we are aiming at our intermediate age children. Um, these, these pro both these programmes, sorry, are free to schools. Um, this is part of what we do as our charity. All these things are what we do as our charity work. Um, but this is about the fact that intermediate age children have some real issues around building resilience, strong relationships and a strong sense of self-identity. You all will see in the mental health stats that keep flying around. This is some of the work that we're doing to try and head that off at the pass. Um, we are looking for a partner. This has been run as a pilot and getting very good um, reception around the country. But we're looking for a partner organisation to help fund it so that we can roll it out and have it be free to schools. It's all right. Don't need to interrupt, but <laughs> power, power, power talk. Power, no, power. Shops. These are starting to turn up. This is how we do some of our funding. Um, medical alarms, you've seen the ads for these. This is what keeps people in their own homes. About a third of these calls that come through to us are accidental act activations. However, we can actually turn up and check on people and make sure they're fine. Uh, first aid training, this is where we started and this is what we still offer. We teach everything from babysitting courses through to advanced resuscitation skills for health practitioners. We cover the, the works. Um, oh, and we have a mental health first aid course as well. Everything else that we do, uh, look, we're running a whole lot of pilot programs. Um, we have, because of the fact that we started in Christchurch, we've got the only fleet of vintage ambulances, for example, in the country. But we're also doing work around getting AEDs into communities and teaching the communities CPR for free. Um, so we're working quite closely with the Otatahi Community Housing Trust at the moment and getting, uh, getting places into them. Um, I think that's me. <laughs> yeah, well done. Well done you. No, but th thank you very much. And um, I, th I think what you've demonstrated is that there is an incredible you know, breadth and depth to what you do. And uh, I think it is a really helpful reminder, especially as you go into your campaign for your fundraiser this weekend, uh, just to remind people <coughs> how much you do, um, you know, rely on the generosity of not only your own volunteers, but of others who will financially contribute. And as I said when I started, ideally what we're looking to do is actually to reach out to each and every one of you and say, can we actually sit down and talk with you can we talk about what's happening in your communities? Can we talk about what is needed, what is missing? Where should we be focusing next? You couldn't have chosen a better meeting to make that point to because you've got every chair of the, every community board sitting in behind. They're presenting their reports today. And I know that they are going to welcome St John's you know, directly 
um, relating to them at the community board level, and I know that they will all have issues that they will want to raise with you. And we want to hear them, we want to know about it. We can't Excellent. help if we don't know what's going on. Um, and sometimes we get our heads a little bit stuck in the emergency ambulance service um, in terms no. of our immediate focus. Well, I really appreciate you reaching out today, um, really appreciate your presentation, and I know that the community boards, um, and I'll just ask all councillors to join with me in thanking you in the way that I think is appropriate. <laughs> and good luck for your fundraising this weekend. Oh, that's annoying, but never mind. <laughs> yeah. um, but th thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Uh, and the next one is um, Davina Penny, uh, who's coming to talk about uh, land use. Thank you. The MPS regarding productive land is hugely relevant. Only 5% of the available land in this country is LUC 1 to 2 class soil, and only 14% of the land is LUC 1 to 3, with all three classes versatile with high potential for productivity. The land shown north of State Highway 1 is coded. The blue areas bordered in red are LUC 1 to 3 land, and the green boxed areas are those indicated in a 2014 report to Council regarding quarry rehabilitation. And the green boxed areas are sites identified by the industry as being potential sites and the blue boxed area was consented in 2020. All sites are fully inclusive or significantly inclusive of LUC 1 to 3 land. Valuable soil is removed through quarrying. Rehabilitation in this region is not undertaken in a timely manner, and we also know it's likely to mostly be in the form of just 30 centimetres of soil, which is grassed. Very close to aquifers, which may rise due to climate change issues. Pastoral use and grass grain is the only viable option. Food production on any commercial scale is not. Quarrying should not be consented as an activity on HPL. There are alternatives for these sites, and yes, they may be a few k's further away from the end use, but there are alternatives. There will be claims from the industry to justify the use. Expect claims of increased carbon footprint instead of the usual hand-wringing of increased transport costs. Well, the answer is this. They should lead the way in investing in and investigating alternative forms of transport, including the electrification of fleets in this fast-moving technological space including on-site use. The Supreme Court has said outright avoidance is a response that is legitimately available under the RMA. Therefore, no, should, no consent should be considered on HPL, regardless of what mitigation or remediation is proposed by the industry. It's likely to be unproven and come with high risk. With 23 to 30 years of aggregate currently available in this region, the environment should be sustainably managed in advance of the NPS being gazetted. Provisions are already applicable in the RPS and have been for some time. My second request is for setbacks from quarrying activities to be applied that will offer protection to residents and communities. All councils have a responsibility under the Health Act to protect or improve health. And this starts with where activities are permitted and the land use consent falls at the feet of CCC. And I will add today that you can have kicked that can well and truly into your backyard. I'm asking that one kilometre is considered for the following reasons. Mitigation measures used are poor. Water is the measure of choice, which is limited in effectiveness, but it's free to the operator. Technology is available used elsewhere that utilises water, but will include dust collection systems, covered operations, and out-of-hours ongoing mitigation. Currently non-existent, but wind does not abide by quarry operating times, and Easter Sunday was proof of this. With regular high winds in this region, PM10 and smaller can and does disperse high distances and certainly beyond 500 metres. Claims of lower distances by applicants are not substantiated. Compliance monitoring, response and investigation is woeful and may indicate a breach of the Health Act. There is no deterrent for operators to ensure they do not impact on those in the vicinity. Quarries do not operate in isolation in this region. Clusters evolve, comprising of several operators with cumulative effects, which, when combined, are significant for those in the vicinity. The carp indicated a cow barn would be one kilometre from a residential zone, a more significant setback than that for a quarry. And additionally, residential property owners must be given the same rights as those in residential zones. Being treated differently amounts to discrimination, which is not provided for in the Health Act. This council sets the ball rolling with where the quarry is sighted, tipping that first domino 
So please, can I ask that you do the right thing for your residents? Current setbacks have proved to be ineffective, particularly when super quarries involving several operators do become the norm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, th your submissions covered uh, the um, air quality issue, which I think you've submitted to ECAN on, is that right? I have, but they did rightly point out the uh, siting of the quarries is that first domino, it's where it's sited, which does have a big impact and that yes. falls in the and council. And as you'll know, the, the, the district plan was completely rewritten uh, by the independent hearings panel. It was part of a process that was um, a post-earthquake land use recovery plan process. Uh, and it was a, um, and this particular issue we are all very well aware of because uh, the council, uh, as an organisation, uh, had to submit based on the level of expertise that they brought to the issue. Uh, the council laws didn't agree with that, and we we um, looked for a, a an expert who could provide independent expert advice to the independent hearings panel to increase the setback between quarries and residential. So we totally agree. Uh, the independent hearings panel didn't agree <coughs> with our position, with our expert, <coughs> and they accepted um, the other submissions that they had received. And so the setbacks are not um, as what they're not sufficient in our view. But we can't change our district plan um, to achieve any any greater setbacks. We tried and we were not successful in achieving that. So we really appreciate the issue, um, but the, the solution isn't here. Uh, but we do agree that ECAN's role in monitoring the conditions of the resource consent as applied to air quality are absolutely imperative to the operation of the system. And so um, we will ask our Chief Executive to uh, raise this with ECAN to make sure that the monitoring processes are the best that they can be because you're entitled to that. So that, that's that's where I have to leave things because. Um, can I just ask, um, would uh, part or subsection E of section 23 of the Health Act be applicable no. where you can impose bylaws no, to protect it's not. health? It's not. It's not applicable. It's in relation to the uh, relation to other health matters, but air quality sits with ECAN, not with the City Council. But I think you know that. I think the, the issue for us here, and we want to move this forward in a positive way, is to make sure that our council as an organisation is ensuring that, the, um, that, that we present to, the, to ECAN, which is the, which is the monitoring organisation, uh, to make sure that they are actually um, enforcing what are resource consent conditions. They're obliged to do that. So thank you very much for your um, presentation this morning. Thank you. I'm sorry we can't offer anything more than that. Yeah, the residents are just going to be ending up taking legal action as an only recourse. I think that's all, we, all they've got, really. True. Thank you. Yeah. Right, and we've got um, the uh, Ross... Is it... Um, I'm not, not pronouncing your name. Is it Ross Holliston. Holliston. So is Holliston. it, is it yeah. spelt H O U L I S? T O N. Yeah. Yeah. So that was it was misspelt in front of me. That's why I was having <laughs> difficulty right. with it. Sorry. Right. Thank uh, you. Now I'm research submissions officer for the Greater Hornby Residents Association, and uh, we fully support the fact that the RMA is just a joke, an absolute standing joke in the way it is worded at the current time and there is room for it to be improved and needs investigating. However, today I've got this here. All LUC 1 to 3 land in the Christchurch city boundary should be excluded from quarrying operations. It is productive land. Quarrying is non-productive, it is destructive. Straight out destructive. <coughs> While commissioners are approving individual quarry operations as being less than minor effect, the true fact is they are far more damaging than less than minor when combined together. Mm. We have instances in Town Road where between Fulton Hogan's and Ablett's, they cannot distinguish where the dust is coming from. They are too close together. 
they need shifting apart so that the blame can be put in place. These facts have been tested in the environment court and upheld. GHRA are currently undertaking dust monitoring and this will remain ongoing into the foreseeable future. This time they're in negotiations with suppliers in Australia, USA and China. These monitors must be robust enough to stand up in court proceedings while remaining mobile so they can be located to various sites. Somewhat bewildering to see three authorities, the City Council, ECAN and the CDHB burying their heads in crystalline silica sand and leave them more prominent parts exposed to the air over PM10, PM2.5 dust. The same attitude was taken with log fires would still have a serious smog issue. Difference here is that crystalline silica dust comes not only from crushed aggregate, but also from the sand that aggregate lies in. Crystalline silica is also harder to see, so is often ignored. Crystalline silica dust has also been recorded as travelling 8 to 10 kilometres. Crystalline silica also does not cause asthma, but silicosis and other respiratory illnesses. So in fact is far worse and more dangerous than any soot. The quarry industry has long been suspected by many for its perceived lack of accountability, or else they would have stepped up with the true facts instead of the lines they tend to distribute to distribu uh, justify themselves. If what they say is true, there would be no setbacks in Australia, India or anywhere else in the world. New Zealand is way behind the times on this matter, and a review of the RMA Act is well overdue. Queensland requires a two kilometre setback if over 1,000 people live in a village, while in India, which is heavily populated, requires one kilometre setback. Does this mean we now live in a fourth world situation? So our opinion, these quarry operators have very deep pockets and very short arms when it comes to residents' health and safety, but the opposite when trying to buy within the city's boundary. We have quarries with earthquakes salvage in them, often buried when it was meant to have been sorted and relocated to safe disposal sites. In short, the public in the western area of the city have been manipulated for long enough. We've had constant complaints about levels of dust in our area. The dust this year has really come to the fore since the earthquakes and the Roberts Road quarry opening. When asked if complaints have been lodged with council, the reply is you're just wasting your breath. Now, I don't mean this particular council as such, ECAN is every bit as bad, don't worry. No one really listens to the complaints about quarries or past quarries, such as those behind Boston Ave. Perhaps this dialogue needs further airing on fair go sometime in the future. The Greater Hornby Residents Association believes no further quarrying operations should be approved between Islington, High High, Templeton and Yeldhurst. There is a block of land in there that is suitable for industrial development or residential development, not quarrying. In the meantime, the Greater Hornby Residents Association requests a moratorium on all quarry consents and approvals from today forward under the current district plan so public health can be considered along with residents' concerns regarding the ongoing quarrying operations that have been taking place. against their wishes. This should be a full, open, as well as a transparent investigation moving forward. Any opposition from within the quarrying faction should be seen as merely, merely trying to protect their patch, so to speak, while still ignoring residents' concerns and health. Understanding orders, I believe this request is not out of order, seeing that there is an aggregate supply equivalent to some 23 years without a decision on the Royden Quarry application, which is currently before the Employment Court. So delay is not a factor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ross. Um, look, uh, it, it, it's, I think you've heard what I said to the mm. previous submitter, that um, uh, it's an inappropriate phrase, but we're between a rock and a hard place. Um, you know, when you're talking about quarrying, um, it is, it, and, and you have talked about the, um, the Resource Management Act, 
the government has announced that there are significant changes coming. Uh, the, but I don't want people to have um, a, an unrealistic expectation of what that might open up by way of um, public involvement in decisions around development. So I'm just I'm trying to be as um, open about this as I possibly can. I do note that the national policy statement for highly productive land has not yet been brought into effect. It is still a draft. They are still working on the detail of it. We submitted it on it in 2019. Mm. So it is, um, it's obviously been a process that hasn't uh, led to something that I personally was very much looking forward to, which was to find some protection from the law from the development, inappropriate development um, or use of highly productive land. But um, so you've raised serious issues. I'm actually thinking I'm coming to uh, visit the Greater Hornby That's residents so in the very near future. Yeah. So I'm now well prepared with a set <laughs> of um, questions that I'm obviously going to be asked to answer on that day. So, but thank you very much. I hope you've taken some comfort from the fact that the Chief Executive will follow up with ECAN. No, um, that is good. Thank you. Possible, possible. Based on the uh, Ross and also the Vina, the kind of the, uh, the deputation, uh, the Vina emphasized still every council should have a responsibility to review also section 23 of uh, the Health uh, look, Act. Uh, Jimmy, and, uh, Jimmy I'm, just, I'm just going to hold Look, I know how possible. passionate you are. You are the best representative for a council area that you could possibly imagine. But I just don't want... <laughs> I, I, don't care, I don't care who else I, I offend around the table. But, 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 but Jimmy, Jimmy wants to make the point. You, you've made the point, Jimmy, and that... I'm going to be meeting with the Greater Hornby Residents Association. I doubt that they will mind if you come with me, and um, and we'll 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 follow it up with them. But I think people do need to clearly understand the limitations um, in our resource management system. We, we do. Um, we do. And 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 I know that you understand that we have been we have been trying within the parameters yep. of the framework that we have to work to as well. Yep. But we'll continue to work together as much as we possibly can. Um, so, If I may say, um, yeah, we have, as you know, we have problems with dust. Yeah. It is not only limited to ECAN and the City Council, it is um, prosecutable under the Crimes Act. Yeah, and well, that may but, come but let, let's eventually. Take, let's all take we that hope off, not. Let's all take that offline because we, we do want to get the outcome. Yeah. So thank you very much, Ross, for, for um, making yourself available um, this morning. And um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. So, and uh, at the beginning of the meeting, I also forgot to acknowledge the um, amazing ARA broadcasting students who are here today. So could I have a special welcome to our um, ARA students? They uh, are um, undertaking a course of study that leads them into the um, tremendous and tremendously important world of the Fourth Estate. Um, and uh, thank you very much for coming and observing our meeting today. And uh, I hope that you felt that it's been an interesting start uh, to the meeting. So thank you. Right, now we'll move on to uh, deputations by appointment, which we have none. Presentation of petitions, also none. And then we move on to minutes uh, the uh, minutes so if somebody would like to move uh, those two minutes uh, Tim Scandrit second of Pauline Cotter put that motion all those in favor say aye those aye. opposed aye. say no that's carried the supplementary reports could I have somebody move that they be added to the agenda um, Mike Davidson second of Jimmy Chen I'll put that motion all those in favor say aye those opposed say no that is carried and now we arrive at the community board monthly reports uh, and we start with Waipuna Hallswell Hornby Rickerton community board Mike Mora chair and Helen Broughton deputy chair thank you Good morning, Leanne and councillors and our journalism students. Thank you. I didn't realise that I had it up on the screen here anyway, but um, thanks for the opportunity to present our report. And I apologise for not being at the last meeting and because I was at the ECAN meeting 
um, on, on the same issue that you've just heard from. So, uh, the no part A's, and um, at our last meeting we did talk about culture galore and since then it's, um, we've had that at Ray Blank Park and just want to say yet again um, what a wonderful event it is and it's a great partnership between our community board and our neighbours um, so yeah Fennelton, Waimari, Heath our Harewood community board so <laughs> we've got an easier name we? <coughs> we're yeah so the horn and the and the Hornby Centre. So we had the blessing of that um, recently. And there's a can we click on the photo for that, please, whoever's clicking? No. The one with Jimmy with his arms outstretched. No, no, that's that was in the last presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think she just put it on the wall. So, I've got a photo of him here in our area report, so I just thought I'd mention that. So we're really, really pleased to see work commence, commenced on that. So um, it's going to be a journey, a, um, but it's yeah, a good it's a journey. Point. The first step's always the best. No, it's not. It's the last step that's the best when it's opened and the people are actually using it. So we're really, really looking forward to that. It's long overdue in our, in our um, ward. And there's another thing that's happening too about the hydrotherapy pool. Um, there's funds being um, raised within the community and the wider community so that we get, we get everything, um, if we can, in this build. So we're, we're, um, we're extracting external funds and support from from around um, White Christchurch, wider Christchurch and stuff to, to actually get the whole lot. So um, we really look forward to that. And um, matters of interest, we had a, a, um, a good meeting with our, if we click on um, the Nightstream School, please. Yeah, Nightstream School. So um, Nightstream School hosted our community board for our last board meeting there, and uh, that was um, that was very good to get out in the community. It was well accepted by the community, and um, so that's yeah. We're going to be doing a bit more of that this term as well. We're following in the footsteps of our Cashmere Spraden um, community board. So, and after that, we had the meeting on the um, a meeting about the residents' concerns about. Um, the John Patterson, uh, the, yeah, the Richmond Ave and the John Patterson intersection, and um, there was a lot of there's been a lot of emails flying around um, about that for quite some time. Um, we did have a meeting um, straight when the road first opened, and then we've had another meeting since then to see how the effects were because coming from a motorway um, into a 40k area is is quite a, an issue. So. We just really, really wanted to hear what the community have said. Um, the the staff came and did a, a, an excellent presentation of the um, of the issues, how they were seen, and and they're going to come back with. They listened to the public. They're going to come back with three other um, options for tidying up other anomalies and uh, or other problems in it. So it was a really successful meeting. Good. So that's um, yeah. Now the um, the can we click on the next? Yes, this was the first. So the great the Greater Hornby Residents Association organised um, the Great Easter Egg Hunt, and it was also um, sponsored by the Lolly Shop in Hornby. So Excellent. they had um, the three three parks in our in our ward: Branston Park, Broomfield Common, and Denton Park. So. That was a really, really exciting event and well run by the community, for the community, so um, that's much appreciated. Watch this space because there'll be more of that to come. The next one, please. If there is a next one, is that the lot? Well, I'd just like to follow up by saying um, the Community Garden Awards were held last night and it was a, a very, very well attended, very well attended. There was about 180 odd people um, actually came to receive that. So anyway, and then, um, yeah, it was held at Tihapua 
and the staff did a great job of putting that on, so um, that was another, you know, a good thing in our, in our ward. But following the two presentations this morning on the, um, on the quarry issue, one of the things is we've got, we've got ECAN saying, um, when we present, presented to ECAN, or that, that it's a Christchurch City Council issue, it's a land use consent um, that, is, that is an issue. So what we really want, what I'm pleading with is, can we please get a, a, a plan change? Can we please get a plan change so that we can get these issues sorted and get a closer relationship with, please, with, um, with Christchurch City Council on the land use and ECAN? Yeah, no, the, the, look, the, the chief executive's just whispered in my ear that, that obviously the relationship between the two is the same. I've already just explained that we cannot get a plan change on this matter, we put up a proposal for a buffer zone, which was rebuffed by the independent hearings panel. So we don't have the um, capability, um, organisationally, anywhere, um, to actually win yes. that argument. So I'm, I'm, well, I'm not going to gonna take um, a submission from the community board based on a report that hasn't actually been debated by the um, by, by the, um, you know, I mean, it, it is not a matter that is in front of us today. No, so but, um, there, there is obviously issues that need to be followed up in terms of the close relationship between the council and ECAN in terms of enforcement. Yep. But, um, and, and I will come and uh, uh, make sure that people are, are given the opportunity to understand what the, what the key barriers are to changing the Act, but the, you've just heard the Resource Management Act is all changing, so I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to spend any more time on it now. There's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done yes. in order to explain. Am I, am I able to say, Leanne? No, I, I, I'd rather not have you, a discussion I under, about look, I've it. I'm quite trained in the RMA, and you can, council could, if it chooses, lodge a plan change. Yes. It will take two years, and it will be a long journey. And it will be unsuccessful, Helen. Is my yeah. point because the, we tried to get this rule written I into I was our down district there, plan. We can try right. again, Leanne. And, 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 and in two years, and if we fail, what will we have achieved apart from a vast amount of expenditure on expert advice and a decision that will not change the plan. Well, I don't think that's. A, I don't well, think I'd that's a very good I'd rather not have attitude. a debate about it at a meeting okay. where you have been asked to report on your council activity, your community board yes. activities. And we have been. This is an activity we have been involved in. Yeah. And can I just say on another issue on air quality, which is um, ECAN's issue. Mike and I went out with a resident one day, it's three years ago, so a long time ago, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the actual air was filled with particles, mm -hmm. which you could, could actually see. Mm -hmm. And in my experience with ECAN, they're not, we, the residents say when they phone up and complain, the ECAN officer does not come out. No, 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 I'm yeah. So, so that's an I've issue got, I I've can got, take. I've got a the degree camp. of yeah. irritation happening yeah. around the table. Yeah. Um, we have already asked that these um, issues are being dealt with um, in relation to the relationship between the council and ECAN. Okay. So, if we could just leave it there, would, yeah. would Anne? Would you like to move the acceptance of the report? Oh, I second. Seconded just, by just Jimmy. Quickly speak to it. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Quick debate? Yep. Or oh, have you got a question? No, no it's quick. Yeah. We're in debate. It's moved second. Sorry. Did, did, well, it was just a question on Helen's point was around, is that when it's, which wind is that? Oh, right. no, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I just, I just moved us well, on. We have the same issue that. in our ward when there's a Norwest. Yes, they don't, just don't turn up, this, and then you ring them, and ECAM will say, we've got two officers, we, it's a Norwest wind. We, have, got, I'll give you yeah. we have already but. said that we will ask the Chief Executive to raise the enforcement issues with ECAM, because could, it, is, it does sit with ECAM. We can put it in our submission. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes we've yes. got a submission to ECAM yep. on the agenda today, and Thank we you. can. Thank you. We can do that. Thanks, so, debate. Yeah, it's very quick. Just to say that... We are putting in our LTP submission to ECAN the need to have an activity 
level of service about how they respond to complaints about air quality. Yes. I would encourage everyone that's concerned today yep. to please make submissions to ECAN on their long-term plan, asking for a level of service about responsiveness to air quality complaints. Thank We've you. already Thank got you. it in our submission. We have put it in, and we'll certainly be speaking to it later today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, thank you, the, the, the host will home be rest, uh, the Richardson Community Board you know, to uh, the present to us so positive things. Particularly, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize the, the, uh, the chair of the uh, Community Board. You know, the, this time is a total different from the previous time. This time, actually working together collaboratively, also working together with the community. So they raise this kind of issue. The cultural gelo may be successful, uh, particularly over the last uh, 22 years. Home be the, the, the uh, center. My understand, even now, every day have uh, people pass through mm. to, to monitor what's the pro progress and update yeah. status. It means long awaited uh, the, complete, the, the facility for the wider home be area. A nice thing, why? You know, we just shift uh, those community board meeting to the nice thing, the primary school. We can attract more local people can turn out. And that's good uh, the, the change, but the change that's actually is a transformation. But regarding the community board and the two kind of the, the residents, you know, the particular on behalf of the community to raise this the issue, this is a big issue because they already get some evidence, you know. This uh, uh, the crystallized the silicon or this uh, PM10, they will uh, the affect the, the physical body. You know? that, that's quite a serious issue. So my view, you know, now we'll make the summation through the long-term plan to the ECAN. Also, you know, I encourage community and also community individually make the submission to the ECAN. We resolve this problem as quickly as possible. Otherwise, you know, we Council still not bear our responsibility because there's a particular critical health issue. Thank you. Thank I'll you. put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, I've got the uh, Waikura Linwood Central Headcliffe Community Board um, and Alexander David. Is Michelle? No. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, thanks so much for having us here this morning. Um, I am going to take it that the report has been read. Um, we have no part A's today. So um, we have had approval for um, several road namings um, for a subdivision in Port Hills Road. We've had Steed Lane and Wheat Sheaf Lane. Um, we have had approval of discretionary response fund contributions to the Mount Pleasant Pottery Group incorporated towards the building upgrades there. Um, the Sumner Community Pool towards equipment and materials, Kamehia Early Learning Trust towards resources and equipment, um, the Gaelic Football and Hurling Association for Canterbury towards costs of holding the New Zealand Gaelic Football Championships, which was recently, and Christchurch Transitional Architecture Trust towards Christchurch East Walks. Um, the board have been spending a lot of time over the last month um, engaging for our long-term plan. We have been out in the community going to several, um, well, multiple community events. Um, and we've also been at Eastgate Mall and at the Mount Pleasant Markets. So been out and about and we've had some great discussions with the community, which has been very valuable. Um, I think we have discussed Wollstone Boxing Club previously, um, but at the 3rd of March meeting, Holly Sullivan 
um, the secretary and head coach of Wollstone Boxing Club presented to the board, advising the board that the club had grown and that it currently has a huge wait list as the club's current facilities are not large enough. Um, the club are investigating funding to purchase um, and build um, or lease a facility. Um, and the board have agreed to request staff to work with Wilston Boxing Club to investigate possible facilities, sites um, for the club and um, report the outcome back to the board. So they're doing some really amazing things um, at Wilston Boxing Club. We're in real support of them in our community. Mm -hmm. um, we have had, oh, sorry. sorry, I'm all back to front today. Um, oh, wait, well, it's, it's are we back? It's, it's not working when you push the button. Oh, we're bro <laughs> we broke it, sorry. Um, <laughs> we have had our Edible and Sustainable Garden Awards. So um, due to COVID, we weren't able to actually have the ceremony. Um, to present awards, um, but we got out into the community and handed out the awards, which is actually really awesome. We got to go out and see people's gardens and the amazing stuff that's happening within the community, and um, actually people really loved being able to show off what they were doing. So, yeah, it was actually pretty cool, um, rather than standing in a hall. Um, but we did also have our um, Community Pride Garden Awards, um, which we don't have photos for today but um, they were very successful we had them at Tūranga last week and yeah um, massive crowd always like a great place for um, bumping spaces and people sharing information and great stuff that they're doing within their communities um, we have had a site visit to uh, Te Pau Tui Tui. Um, it's very exciting. It is a great size and I think the community are very, very excited about it. It was amazing actually being able to go on site and see what um, the work is behind um, our facilities that we do have. Um, inside a pool there's obviously a lot of work going on so it was really fantastic being able to see behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, we've got a lot of very excited people for that occurring in October. Um, we have had two community board sp sponsored fresh events um, for young people and over the last month. Um, the first on the 13th of March at the Art Gallery, which was awesome. And um, the best part of it was actually being able to showcase, it's a very dark picture, you can't really see anything. But um, <laughs> it was uh, being able to showcase young people and their awesome uh, musical talents. Like we had some really great performances by local young people. Um, but then we also had Scribe come along. It was cool. He did some rapping. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> and we have also had the Waltham Pool Party, which was awesome as well. So we had really good turnouts with both of those events. Um, we have had, within our area, the Wollstone Gala, which was on the 27th of March, the Avery Gala on the 28th of March. Sorry, we've really broken the system. Um, and the Phillipstown Gala on the 20th of March. Um, we also had the Wollst... Oh, no, I said that. Okay. Did we fix it? Yeah. Okay, we fixed it. Um, and yes, yeah, so we've got a couple of events that are coming up as well. We've got the Mount Pleasant Pottery Group opening, which I think is this Saturday, and the Fresh event, the Central Hoops event, which is coming up on the 21st of April. And happy holly. So, um, Sunita came to our board meeting the other day, and it was really cool. We had um, our broadcasting students there as well and members of the public and we all got into Holly so happy Holly everyone mm -hmm. thanks for having us <laughs> thank you Jake I presume you want to move this yes. Sarah second any questions any discussion I'll put the motion all those in favour say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. You're cool. such a busy community board. You do so much. Yeah, we've well got done. a lot going on. So thank yeah. you for your thank patience you. and time. <laughs> uh, Waipapa Papanoi Inners Community Board.
Kia ora koutou. Um, thanks for having us along to present today. Um, I'm going to take the report as read and we don't have any part A, so we're just going to highlight a few things that have been going on in our area. Um, just first up, I do want to say we this year decided not to run our community board events like the Edible Gardens and the Community Pride Garden Awards and those sorts of things. Um, we put that money back into our um, funding to go out to community groups this year. Um, so that's why we don't have any pretty pictures of those things. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's just acknowledging Children's Day, uh, which is really a city-wide event, uh, but with some high involvement from the Waipapa Papanui and the staff, and in particular our recreation advisor. Uh, it was really sad to see that it couldn't go ahead in person this year because of the issues around COVID levels at that time. Uh, but was really what was really uh, good to see was there was really good engagement online. It shifted to an online event, and there was really positive engagement. Uh, by the community with that format uh, and looking forward to it coming back in person next year. Um, we had our first principals meeting for the year. This is something we do once a term with the principals from our area. Um, we give, uh, have a breakfast meeting and we usually invite a guest speaker along um, and then we just have a general chat about what's happening in the schools. Um, and this month we had staff from the Council's Learning Through Action program come to speak about what's on offer for schools through their programs. Um, part of the reason for doing this is because our board has um, recognised the importance of civic education for young people. Um, and so this year we've actually set aside some funding to pay for transport to get school, school children to those um, council courses um, programs on that. So we wanted to let the principals know what was on offer there and um, we've had some uptake on that already so that's great to see. Uh, community events, sort of the summer season is coming to a close now. We've had a slice of summer, a series of events, the final one uh, held at the end of February in Sheldon Park, run by Belfast Community Network. Uh, also on the same day, the Community Focus Trust uh, ran a community day in St Albans. Uh, both of those were really well supported and had great feedback uh, from those who attended. Um, we also had the Shirley Shine event, which was run by um, Shirley Community Trust. Um, that was attended by over a 1,000 people at McFarlane Park. And then that bottom picture there is one of our Summer With Your Neighbours um, events. It was the Willowview Community Gardens in Redwood Springs at the Reserve in there. Uh, Mayor and councillors will be well aware that this weekend we're opening the St Albans Community Centre. Uh, construction is complete. It's been handed over to the St Albans Residents Association, who are the operators of the facility. Uh, we've been gifted the name Kohinga, uh, which really has a triple meaning in this context. Uh, it really means to gather or to collect, and it reflects the uh, geography of the area with waterways uh, that come together as tributaries. It also reflects the historic use of the area by mana whenua in uh, gathering as a mahinga kai area. Uh, and also the now current use as a community centre of the community gathering together uh, under that roof. The official in opening is this Saturday morning. You will all have been invited and we look forward to seeing uh, the Mayor and uh, some, of, some of our councillors uh, there as well. Um, another thing that has been happening behind the scenes is this correction of a historical misspelling of um, what has been called the Kaputoni uh, stream. Um, this came up as we were looking at consultation on name changes at two reserves on the Styx River. Um, the original Māori name of the waterway was Kaputahi, but the story goes that it was misread and then has been spelled incorrectly ever since. Um, so we're wanting to restore its original name, and so that process is underway. It was pre Yes. Long time ago. Uh, and just... Uh, an update for councillors and the Mayor on downstream effects of the Northern Corridor motorway. Uh, there's ongoing work at the moment and really experimental traffic calming underway in consultation with the local neighbourhood uh, in the Francis Street area. Uh, that is leading to some frustrations in adjacent streets. Uh, at the moment Francis Avenue is being cul de sac for a couple of weeks in one format and then there's a mid-block cul-de-sac being trialled again under temporary traffic management so that we can get feedback from the community on the impacts that's having and we can see what it does to traffic patterns. Uh, one thing it is doing to traffic patterns is it's diverting some traffic, including local traffic, to adjacent streets and uh, we're getting a lot of questions at the moment from residents about, about that and it's keeping our staff and uh, council staff here very busy uh, responding to those. 
Uh, also, last week there was a public meeting in Redwood for residents in that area who are being impacted by noise from, uh, from the motorway. Uh, that meeting was organised and facilitated by Duncan Webb. Uh, we had NZTA and project staff in attendance as well. There's been some actions uh, come out of that. Uh, there's a number of questions about aspects of the design being asked by residents. Uh, one of the really obvious things at the moment is we're in the period where the motorway has opened and is being operated at full speed, but the final low noise asphalt seal on the road is not there. So we've kind of got the worst of both worlds and how it's operating right now. Uh, that seal is programmed to go on in the next sealing season, which starts in spring, but we could be up to a year away for the, from that being completed. Uh, so there's some questions being asked at the moment that's sitting between Dr Webb and NZTA. Uh, all the Papua Nui uh, community board staff um, uh, members and our two councillors were both at that meeting as well to support residents who are um, really clearly being impacted by that issue. Yeah, um, one thing that residents do want to happen straight away there is for NZTA to drop the speed limit on the motorway to reduce the noise. Um, they were told at that meeting that this wouldn't make enough, it wouldn't make a noticeable difference, um, but um, as Simon said, Duncan Webb is following that up on behalf of those residents as a local MP. And that's us. Thank you. Um, and I've noticed that um, Councillor Davidson's got a couple of um, uh, additional recommendations that he'd like included in the resolution, which is um, requesting that I write to Waka Tahi and um, request that the speed limit is temporarily, temporarily reduced to 60k. Um, until the final services services added. So, th mm. from my understanding of the meeting, the public were quite clear that when the when it was opened, it was at a lower speed and it was um, noticeably quieter than it was yes. when the speed limit went yes. up. And um, they, the public, have noticed that cars are going well over 100 at the moment. So, yeah. bringing it down should. And the second one is that I write to the Minister of Transport outlining council's concern with the current speed limit of the motorway and adverse effects on neighbouring residents. But again, I assume that is until the final service is added. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Um, Pauline? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to ask Simon about the time frame for that second seal. I, I know that NZTA said it could commence in the spring or October, but I thought they said it would be completed early next year. Are you sure they said a year? Uh, you are correct. Yeah, early next year of completion yeah. is the current target. I guess yeah, we're only just into April, so it's it's. Oh, 10 so months, a year from now, yeah. But so yeah. okay. Um, uh, yeah, a year from now should all be done. Yeah, I thought you meant a year from when it's commences. They start it in spring, and then it's obviously they've got the whole motorway to do yeah. plus QE2 drive. So yeah, because that's relevant for the the time frame that we we're asking for here. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah, thank you, um, Aaron. Yeah, just a question around why the number of sixty and not eighty was selected. I live 50 metres from an 80k state highway and it's, it is a big difference from 100. Well that's just that it was going to open the Right, so that was why you chose? No, there's, there's a little bit more to it than, than that, which I can talk to during my debate. Okay. Well, it might my be comments. useful in terms of questions, but I don't want to take away from yeah. the community board, um, but I might allow a couple of questions of you, Mike, as the I'm assuming that you're moving the, the, the total package. Yes. And yeah. you're seconding the total package, right? Yeah. I'll, so, well, I'll, well, I'll come back because I've, I've got questions of the community <laughs> board. So I'll just come back to you um, uh, on a separate matter, is it, Yanni? It's this matter and a different matter, yeah. Well, can you deal with a different matter with the community board? Yeah, OK. Um, just the Langdon Road um, issue with the traffic. Has there been any progress on that? Uh, we're having a briefing next week from the um, council engineer who's been looking into that, so I'll have an update after that. Right, but is it still a it's still a relevant live issue? Yes, yes absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And uh, did you have a question for the community board on? That? Yeah, just on the um, the the highway or the northern motorway. Um, I was just kind of interested if anyone's looked at the resource consent or the designation, if there were any requirements around noise, because I find it a bit weird that we're, we're writing, you know, normally there'd be construction and there'd be... Yeah, it has a requirement sort of that it's 57 decibels um, maximum, and they, they have been doing testing, 
um, not at peak times, noticeably. Um, and there are some spots that are currently over that 57, but they say they'll come down, hopefully, once they put the final seal on. So that requirement is when it's actually complete. So there's nothing in the interim, because I wonder whether when we're writing, we should actually be trying to address this issue, which has happened in other parts of the city as well, is around when we're building or we're in an alliance or we're consenting, that some thought is given to the transitional period before resurfacing happens, so it doesn't, we don't just keep getting into we, the We, we can take that on board when yeah, we, cool. when we um, address that. I mean, there's nothing in there that prevents that from being Great. included. Mike, did you want to just talk quickly on the... Oh, j just quickly. So one of the questions that was asked um, during this whole process since the noise became an issue, would, would dropping it to ADKs make a difference? Now, Waka Katahi continually said, actually, no, it'll only be one or two decibels and you won't notice it. Um, and they say you'll notice things after three decibels. Um, and if you actually go through all the information on their website, actually reducing it from 100 to 70 has a, a 4.6 decibel drop. Um, so it's clear that actually if we bring it down um, below 70, then we're actually, so there's the graph, that's from the NZTA website, um, which shows there's a clear drop if you go from 100 to 70. Um, so actually if we go past that 80, go right down to 60, then we're actually going to give um, have a lot more uh, effect to what's the noise at the moment it's causing. Yeah, and of course that stops at 100, um, and that hasn't been my experience on there. No, it will need to be enforced. It's an observation. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, so I'll... Yeah. Just I think me being relatively ignorant, so what's the current speed limit? 100. It's 100, so you want to drop from 100 to 60? Yeah, temporarily, yeah. Okay. Until, and just until this... Yeah, sure. Yeah. This is not... This is a request that I write. Yeah, to no, no, I just just for context, I was trying to understand yeah. what it is. And and the context will be put in the letter, so that all of that um, detail. All right. Um. I'll, so it's been moved and seconded. So I'll open it up for debate. Pauline. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on that. Um, oh, and thank you for the presentation. It was very clear and good. Um, on that meeting that I attended as well. And the thing is that. Um, a couple of things the residents pointed out was when a motorway is built in, say, Auckland, and it's within 200 metres of a residential house, they put up fences up there, and they, have, they mitigate the noise. And that question was posed to NZTA, and their response will, was, there's more cars on there than we have here. And that really didn't go down that well, because there's a reasonable number of cars using this motorway as well, and more to, be, more to come. Um, so that was the other thing, and somebody mentioned that there could be, um, there are acoustic panels that can be put up rather than solid fencing, um, so they may look at mitigating it in that way. Um, also the fact that they measure this, uh, the decibels within 200 metres of the motorway, whereas many of these people lived 650 metres away, they were having to have their doors and windows closed because of the roaring noise, they were really, really stressed about this and saying that their windows and doors are also rattling as the cars speed by. So they've been really, really negatively impacted by this. And also, as um, Emma pointed out, the, the monitoring has been done um, between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., which is a l little bit unfair because the traffic does begin at, look, I don't know, 6.30 probably. So I just wanted to highlight those points that people were very, very angry, very upset, and they were there first this motorway has been imposed on them. So um, now that the government has brought the wellbeings back in to the Local Government Act, I think we've got a, um, a bit of leverage there to try and get some, some sympathy for these people and, and to have a temporary mitigation would be very, very helpful. So thanks, Leanne, for doing that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, Aaron? Um, I would have been very supportive of ADK. I myself live 50 metres from State Highway 1, and uh, when we went through this process and had the temporary for it, and, and it broke up something terrible down there, yeah, they've had a bit better luck on this one. Um, and with the vehicles going past the ADK, you don't notice it. So I would have been a lot happier with 80 versus 60. It seems a, a, a very big jump from the current 100, and that road is flying really well, admittedly to the detriment of those neighbours right now until that seal's done. So um, I would have preferred we'd ask for 80, or are we asking for 60 to try and get to 80? Yeah, we're in debate. Yeah, that, um, that, that's all. Yeah. Um, 
I know that it sounds like a, a really big drop, um, but it will have a really big impact. The reality is that when people are driving on this road, everyone always takes into account that 10k buffer um, that you know they're going to be pinged and things for. So I think that asking for 60 hopefully will mean that people travel under 70. Um, and while the road surface is currently unfinished without its proper sort of state highway type um, top seal and the quiet surface seal, I think that that's a really reasonable thing to ask for, that, um, that they do that. Um, so State Highway 1 um, that, that runs near Councillor Kewan's place will have that um, proper seal already and this road just doesn't yet. Sam. Really briefly, I'm happy to support it. Um, and I only do that because we're not making the decision. It's only a letter to the transport experts who will consider it. So I get exactly what you're saying, Aaron, but in the end, they'll take on this advice amongst everything else. And, and this is only a consideration. It's, we're not making a decision today. So. Thank you. Mike, do you want to close off? The yeah, yeah, just quickly. And obviously, there's quite a few things mentioned in the report. Um, and so, but what we are seeing, I guess, in the area is the um, impact of uh, not just the motorway but also development um, what that's having on local community if you look at Langdon's Road and the massive development that's actually occurring out there and how that's impacting residents um, and then the motorway we always knew that it was going to have a big impact on St Albans which we're seeing um, I think this was a little bit more of a, a surprise um, and, and but actually when we attended that meeting there was a lot of people there and they were all very they were frustrated they were angry they were tired um, it, was, it was very compelling what they were saying and that was the lived experience. They were living with it and some of them were quite far from the motorway and they were, could not sleep because of the noise that was coming off it. Um, you know, that was presented by a few um, officials um, and I just don't think they were quite listening to what the people actually was, were saying. And for them to, to actually say they actually won't notice a difference if we if we drop the speed when actually their own information on the website says something different is, is a shame. Um, look, this is only a small stretch, it's not the whole motorway, it's just the Radcliffe Road where pretty much the residential's all, all finished. Um, so it's not going to have a massive effect on travel time, but it will have a massive um, impact, a positive impact on the people that are living around there suffering from this um, noise that's coming off, off the motorway. Like Sam said, it's just a request. I, I really hope that Waka Kotahi listens to it and actually understands that this could be a solution um, for a short period of time until the, the seal is um, surface is applied and maybe it may speed them up a bit too to get it done quicker. Thanks. Thank, thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Spraden Kashmir, uh, uh, Waihoro, uh, Spraden Kashmir Community Board. Carolyn Potter. Lee's here. No. Kia ora, good morning. Kia ora, Tato. Uh, can I just say in support? Um, I just want to say that we had uh, um, a big, uh, three big nights last week, and um, I just want to thank <laughs> publicly, thank staff led by Joe um, in our local office. I just thought of that when I was stepping down and thinking of the hard work that they put in for all three separate occasions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got no parties, uh, and but we had we've had so many small um, small and big occasions in our ward this last month, almost to compete with Limwood um, Central. Uh, the, this was the celebration. <laughs> This was amazing. I found out this, uh, pro, this campaign to stop the right-hand turn out of Barrington started more than 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. The staff kept saying to me these three people were involved 20 years ago and that formed the foundation of the Older Persons Forum in our ward. And I kept saying, no, that's not true. I've been on the board for up 10 years and I know that these people... It was true. These people started it 20 years ago, a campaign to stop the right-hand turn out of Barrington Mall. The staff knew it. I persisted in saying they were wrong, and I was wrong. And they, um, they started the Older Persons Forum, which continues to this day, and which meeting was held yesterday in our um, offices. And, um, it was, and then... The Sprayden Neighbourhood Network was formed and it started campaigning on it as well. So it's been a very long time mm. that they have wanted to make this safe. 
and the um, council staff have responded before, um, but for reasons of finance or whatever, it never went ahead. And on this occasion, it did. And we had a celebration in the mall because it wasn't appropriate to have a red ribbon across the exit from Barrington Mall with traffic. And there we are with Dennis and um, Sonia, um, leaders of the Spray Neighbourhood Network, cutting the red ribbon that we draped over everyone's shoulders um, in the mall. And we had a cup of coffee and we had a cake, which went all round those people there. And some, um, an ex-member of the Spraden Neighbourhood Network sent flowers up from Invercargill. Thank you. This is, our, um, this is the Edible and Sustainable Garden Awards. I'm so sorry that um, you've made the decision not to have them anymore, um, St Albans, but... Uh, no, sorry, no, no. just this year, yeah. Just because um, it was, it's such a fine occasion. We started it. <laughs> I know you did. We copied you, but we introduced the edible, the yeah. sustainable, sustainable. We so led we on that. that. We did that as um, well. And that, that's, that's Ray King from the Horticultural Society. It, the range of people who um, got awards on this is just wonderful. Young, old, many ethnicities, diverse, wonderful. And it was a great occasion. And th um, this, oh, we, this is consulting on the LTP. Um, I think everybody who's consulted on the LTP will understand that not many people are interested in telling us about what they should, we should put in or out of the LTP, but are always interested in telling us about their roads and rubbish. Um, but um, this is, uh, we, we did it in South Library and we did it in Barrington Mall. And um, so we, and where else have we been? We can, oh, we've consulted in other areas as well. And it's been, it's been an enjoyable process. Um, this is the blessing at West Braden School. We had a marvellous photo of the red sky in the morning as we walked into the school grounds and uh, for the blessings. I do like the ceremony of blessings. Walking around the new building and touching the walls to make them safe is, no, I don't know, it's sort of almost romantic. This building, one building at Braden School has five kitchens. So the education system is shifting its way of teaching people how to live their lives, not just the academic subjects, but how to actually live their lives. It's a very interesting thing for those of us who are older to consider and to understand. So, um, and the blessing was um, a, a great experience. This is the Kashmir Valley Reserve, which is the, probably the most popular playground in our wards. Um, its location is between the river and the hills, and it seems to attract people from everywhere. It's, got a, uh, it's one of the few places that's got a pedestrian crossing outside that is actually recognised by cars. Um, but the, the council did a great job of um, doing a range of plantings outside of that board area. Um, but this was the <laughs> this is the map which led to uh, quite a lot of drama between, uh, involving um, our area and um, Horswell Hornby's area as well, with the residents from Craycroft and Westmoreland. Westmoreland. <laughs> My brain went gap, gap. And that is the size of the road between the two suburbs that is now open. And the residents had been promised, A, that there would never be a road between the two suburbs back up the hill, and B, that when there was going to be a road, it wouldn't be open before the lights went in. So there were some difficulties, some tension, but nonetheless, we had an excellent meeting arranged by the staff, local staff and um, civic staff, uh, Richard and his team, and um, by the, pardon? And John Higgins, oh, I'm glad you mentioned him, because um, he has a hard job, and he was extremely gracious. And um, the meeting went well, and I think there was a, a great understanding on both sides of the table by the end of it. And this is the board meeting at Spraden School. Um, we, have, we alternate our board meetings from 8 a.m. to uh, 5 p.m., and this was a 5 p.m. meeting at Spraden School. 
And the principal in the middle there took us out around the school grounds to show us the changes that have had to be made in the buildings that have been made. They had about three kitchens, mm -hmm. didn't they, mm -hmm. in the block that their, their children are in. Um, and they're next door to Hill Morton High, and they talked to us about establishing a very close relationship with that high school. It was really good to get to know our local community better, and we had several people presenting to that community board, including the local, uh, the local um, garden, community garden, and the young people from Kashmir High wanting more basketball courts, which everyone wants. Um, and there were other things that we did, including discussing the Addington Crossing, um, the Hill Morton High. I got taken around the Hill Morton High new block, several kitchens, by um, the principal. Um, we had a residence meeting at Hoon Hay, which was brilliantly run, one hour out the door. And then later on, um, this last weekend, Mel and I took the LTP consultation to an egg um, discovery, Easter egg thing at the same place. We had um, a, a, a Lansdowne pr uh, um, Play School had a celebration. The George V Reserve had a celebration, which Tim and I were at. Um, the Kashmir View Park, the, um, uh, the Kashmir View Park, and I saw the biggest rubbish dump in our ward going out in the community cars that I've ever seen, and staff are now looking into um, the causes of this rubbish dump and why it's there and how we can remove it right as we speak. It's between the court theatre and the new um, restored mill building in Addington. That's it. Very good, thank you. So uh, Tim would like to move it and you've got a question, um, and Melanie would like to second it. Yes? I guess um, following on from um, Carolyn um, mentioning the Gosford Way um, uh, meeting in, with staff, I do want to thank staff. They're quite right. They were very gracious, but they, they admitted they could have done things better. So I think that's a really uh, good way to go forward, ad to admit there could have been things done better and to, um, to explain how we got to those things. It wasn't perfect, but to learn as we go forward. We're always learning. I think it's really important. One of the interesting things, and it was mentioned with the others community board, the NZTA took sound recordings from a certain time of day. And it's absolutely a waste of time because we also had um, traffic counts taken in December from the uh, certain inter intersection, which is a waste of time because it was school holidays and they were taken out of context. So, you know, we've got to really get a lot better at that and it's got to be like for like and for want of a better term. Um, I think with the um, Walsley Road, um, Hoon Hay Road, we've got a lot of um, opportunity there while it's being done up, and I'd hate to lose that opportunity with staff as we kind of say, oh, well, we've moved on now. So I do still want the community board to work with staff on those opportunities because I don't think they can be lost. It's too important. And we've now gained a bit of faith back with those two residents associations who we have worked with for a long time. We had a great working relationship. It got kicked in the teeth without question over this. Um, and and you, you, you'll be part of this as well. So we've got, we've got to keep that momentum to keep that faith, which we have now re if we lose it again, the work that we do as elected members, both community board and councillors, will be, um, I think, lost and damaged permanently. Well, he was franker than I would have been, but good on him. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Is this part of the debate? Oh, sorry, I thought that was debate. Um, Yanni? Yeah, just in terms of the LTP engagement. No. What? Okay, carry on. Carry do you, on. Do you, just in terms of your engagement, do you, um, do you have like a ward fact sheet or do you think it'd be helpful just when you're engaging with people to have more Oh yeah, we had some hard copies. I know it's contrary to policy, but we had some hard copies to hand out because people want to see them. And staff had presented the information really well. We also had a training session on how to do that um, Bubble thing. You know, we had a training session with local residents on how to do that as well. So that's but using the online tool. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Um, yep. cool. Thank you. And happy to have a comment when it's appropriate. Are we in comments now or debate? Or? 
It was the debate before. Yeah. I okay. allowed you to ask a question. Oh, I just wanted to make the point that it was really good to see the progress around Barrington. Thank you to everyone that's been involved. I know that's been a long standing issue. I, I think what's interesting for Council at a governance level is the fact that we've got Langdon's Road, a similar development happening still after 30 years of something that not being done. That is not in this community board No, no, area. but the issue around planning oh, for shopping care. malls. Look, oh, please don't disrupt well, the meeting. That's enough. Thank why would you. we just allow it to keep happening? Yes. That's correct. I wanted to um, further acknowledge staff. Um, thank you, Carolyn, for acknowledging staff. I mean, I've been involved as well in many community meetings over the last wee while, and staff uh, go over and above, and we really appreciate what they do. Last night, I had three, uh, three staff were cleaning up after the Garden Awards um, on their own, stacking chairs, um, putting food away, doing dishes um, at half past seven at night. So um, we really do appreciate what, what you all do. So thanks. Thank you very much. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is um, uh, Te Pātaka o Rākai Hotu, Banks Peninsula Community Board. Lori Peden. Morena. Thank you, Morena. Tori and um, Tyrone. Thank you. Okay, um, a few updates. I, I do um, take it that our board report has been read, and then there is a few things in there um, that has been going on lately. Uh, just a few things we'll, we'll point out to everyone. Last um, month we had our um, board meeting at the Gaiety in Akaroa. Um, public engagement was strong on the 15th of March, um, with several public forums booked and a couple of hot topics. The board was keen to accommodate the expected large numbers um, and the meeting was moved to the Gaiety. Um, at that time also we were in discussions about COVID and we wanted to make sure that even if we did change alert levels that we could still cater for the, the engagement that, that was requested from the community. Uh, public forum topics um, included the Akira public picnic tables, roading issues, steadfast development, LTP in the Akira Service Centre Citizens Hub desk and the Akira Wastewater. Um, that day we had 30 to 40 public um, come to that, that meeting, so hence why we did make that decision to move to a bigger location. Um, it was well attended. And every single one of them um, in favour and supporting the um, continuing services, of a, you know, the continuing service centre in Akaroa and the funding of that. Um, one of the things that was also brought up at that meeting was the, um, we oh. had um, representation from the Akaroa Bays Lions Club um, put, um, asked us to consider allowing them to fund the construction and erection of shelters over some of the existing tables in Akaroa including the barbecue which the Lions installed some years back. Uh, the purpose for this was to commemorate um, 50th anniversary of the Akira Bay's Lions Club in February next year, um, enhance the Akira furniture scape, provide much needed shelter from the sun for visitors and residents. The photo shown there is um, of a similar project which is in Kaikoura. So it's, like I say, quite exciting having community funding come in to, to help add to the environment and our um, Council assets. Uh, Come to Parry Group in Akaroa um, regarding the cemeteries, um, requested development of the western area of the Akaroa Catholic Cemetery and the installation of the Lynch Gate, um, Lynch Gate Memorial Gate. Um, Council are currently preparing background documentation including conservation plan to support the development plan for all three Akaroa cemeteries. Uh, next steps are to seek input from the Anuku Runanga um, that was a fantastic um, report and we want to thank staff for coming out to Akaroa and Head of Parks to come out and actually work through the issues. And So it is great to actually have the community board working with staff to come up with um, moving forward issues that are going on. So I'd like say big thanks to, to staff for coming out that day. And it's, look, it's worth acknowledging staff because I mean we, we know that there are some tricky issues 
um, on the peninsula, you know, in the one size fits all thing. You know, the geography doesn't always suit and uh, the regulations don't always conform to, to how we need them. So we really appreciate the engagement there mm -hmm. that we are getting from staff on that. Yeah, it is appreciated. And lastly, just regarding community funding, um, recently we did have a um, combined meeting with the Crusher City Council staff and Rata Foundation regarding upcoming, upcoming community funding um, groups from Birdlings Flat, Little River, Pigeon Bay, Rural and Tenants. Um, but it is important how, how the money in the community funding gets used with our community groups. Small amounts of funding from Council and Rata do go a long way. So, and it's acknowledged by the community as well. So that's just one thing we wanted to acknowledge that is going on at the moment. We do know that strength in the community fund is, is um, well used and yeah, well sought after. But yeah, so that's us. I, I did want to acknowledge your missing out on a penguin. Um, and I, I would say that we'd lend you the one that we bought for um, <laughs> the Tūranga, but... Um, it, it, it is it belongs staying, in Tūranga. Yeah, yeah no, it is staying nearby. I mean, it's good to hear that it's, it's in, in Taitapu, but, um, you know, it was... There's, there's quite a few penguins that I know that, that there were um, I locations know. being looked there, after. There, there were, I mean, they went for amazing prices. Yeah, but. it's going to be interesting to see where the Akarol one has ended up, because apparently that was, um, I'm still not sure where that actually has gone, but um, oh. it's in Akarol somewhere, but apparently there's um, a, a, the community find, so they're, they're having a wee community, you know, go out and find a penguin. So right. where the penguin has ended up, it's, it's going to be quite exciting. But um, the last thing is, um, Easter weekend was, like I say, thank you for everyone for travelling local and um, heading out to Akaroa. It was a um, very busy, warm weekend um, right. over Easter and roads were very busy, but um, everyone was very good. But no, thank you. Excellent. Andrew, you'd like to move this? Do I have a seconder? Uh, James Goff, <coughs> put that motion. If you must, yes. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I must, but I'll keep it brief. Um, just relating to the um, Akaroa Cemeteries matter, I'd like to thank staff for work that was done relatively quickly in preparation for the 180-year anniversary of the arrival of the Comte de Paris with the um, Akaroa early French and German settlers on board. Um, at that weekend celebration, there were a number of descendants of those early settlers, many of whom still live in Akaroa, many of whom have um, spread far and wide since then but I'd like to particularly thank staff th for the work that was done um, repairing and restoring three not the two that were expected gravestones so two plus one um, and for work done removing two um, damaging wilding trees that had become um, planted in some of the the grave sites um, the background, and we've heard it in previous um, LTP and annual plan um, submissions in the past, is that the um, cemeteries group, the early settlers group, had been very concerned at the lack of maintenance at the cemeteries. They were delighted with the work that staff have done and are very pleased with the way the cemeteries have been maintained. So that actually represents huge progress, both with the work being done and in the relationships in Akara. It was great to see that resolution passed by the community board that now gives clear direction about the um, memorial gate and the possibility of additional burial space. So it was great that the community board were able to represent the community view in passing that resolution. Thank you very much. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last community board and def what? Oh no, we've got two, two more. more. Oh sorry, I was gonna hope to get through them all before morning tea. We will. Right. Um and, and sorry about that. Joe. Uh, so Joe Zervos is here um, representing Kelly, who's not able to be here today because he's doing something equally athletic to his yes. last uh, reason for not being is here. Is that working? Yeah, White Eye Coastal Burwood Community Yeah, so board. apologies from Kelly. He's um, hiking the Kepler track today so um, or for the last few days, so you're stuck with myself. And Chris, who's here to support me. Mm. <laughs> Rightio, so I think you've all got the report in front of you, so I take it you've read most of it. Um, where do we start off? Um, the approval of removal of redundant metro bus stop in Bowhill Road. Um, this was a bus stop that hasn't been used for a very long time and 
it was actually didn't even have a sign on it, so we just removed the yellow lines. So that's really straightforward. Events in the red zone. Um, we had Polyfest and LTP consultation at Polyfest, and it was absolutely amazing to see so many of the local schools performing and the amount of stalls and food and all colour everywhere is a really good event. Um, the Red Zone 6 bike race is coming up this weekend, is it? No, 26th of April. And that's a six hour mountain bike race through the Daniel, Daniel Park Daniel. area of the Red Zone. Um, anyone's keen, you should enter. Um, at the east by east corner where this has been held, there's actually been quite a lot of events happening lately. And just over the Easter weekend, there was the um, 50 miniature radio controlled semi trucks at the little RC haulers event. Um, very popular with the big boys toys pe people, they love it. Um, a couple of the things relating to the red zone that I'd like to actually thank staff for. Um, the Bower Park fence, which runs between the red zone and the actual park has been removed and opening up the space and it looks wonderful. So, um, so thankful for that. In South Shore, um, they, we got hold of staff and got no camping signs installed in all the cul-de-sacs which go on to the estuary side with the red zone and I had a lady ring me the other day and she reported that they're working a real real treat and that they've had camper vans actually pull up into the cul-de-sacs and just continue driving on so she's really grateful for that. Um, Stitch o Matt is one of our community groups and they do a wonderful job. Um, they're a resource of upskilling sewing skills and recycling fabric and creativity and they do all sorts of things from making the mask which they made 100 for Children's Day which is unfortunately cancelled because of COVID and they will use those masks for future events. Um, with Stitch and Matt they make wonderful quilts and things for um, people in need, um, all sorts of blankets, clothes, everything, little toys there. Um, they are actually relocating from where they are now and they're moving into a shop in the Surfside Mall, so that's really positive for them. Parkland's community meeting, that's going to be held tonight. It was scheduled to be held Thursday the 4th of March, but because of COVID it was postponed. Local school representatives, the police, council staff will be in attendance to listen um, and look at ways and solutions that we can actually look at helping the community. There's been a lot of um, crime and just um, especially around their little Parklands Reserve. Um, so tonight we will actually be going to that. The council we have actually funded for a facilitator for Chris Meany to actually go along, so we're really thankful for that. Um, Chris does a wonderful job, and we'll be looking to work proactively with them moving forward. Coast snap. Um, if you've been down to the pier, you probably would have seen the little frames that or you've installed down at the pier. Um, so it's a global initiative, whereas you put your cell phone into the frame and you take a photo of the exact same location each time to see the differences in the coast. Um, it's really helpful because at the moment the coast has been accreting severely and if you look at the pipelines along the beach at the moment, um, which is stormwater pipelines, they're about 75 centimetres under sand. So they're actually blocking up with sand. So um, hopefully we'll get 
a nice big storm soon that will actually suck most of the sand away and clear it out. Um, the site visit to South Brighton Surf Life Saving Club, this is awesome. Kelly and I went down and we got shown the through by Rowan McNaughton and brand new facility, nice big community space. Um, they've got such a good lookout over the beach and a big community space where they hopefully will have some events held there, um, hire it out to people that want to use it for like an exercise room. Um, they've even got an elevator inside there, which is pretty flash for a surf club. Um, with these, you can see they've got a little bit of car parking around the side and a new tar seal, and they're really thankful that the road adjacent along Marine Parade has actually all been sealed again, and it's looking lovely. Um, but they're still working on trying to get the bit between the road and the new sealing done because it's a wee bit rugged from the construction. So it's looking fantastic and it's very exciting to see another surf club upgraded, especially since I'm a surf lifesaver. And <laughs> um, peer-to-peer race, this was on last weekend and you can see our very lovely MC James Daniels there helping out for the day. Um, I actually went in and did the walk and everyone else ran, but it was a wonderful event and the peer-to-peer -peer race actually used to be held in New Brighton for years and years. And then just after the earthquakes, they cancelled it and it hasn't been held since. So this is reintroducing it and trying to get it up and going again. It wasn't very well supported, probably due to the fact that the City to Surf was before. But the event was a, a wonderful thing for the area because every entrant got a $10 voucher to actually use at New Brighton on the day and five dollars of that was actually put in by the club and five dollars from the actual shop it was used at. So um, a good initiative and something to try and keep moving in the area. Um, other things that have been happening in the area, just last weekend the New Brighton Rugby Club which is part of Eastern Sports and Rec had their 100 year centenary celebration. Um, and that was really, really well supported. There was cars parked for miles and really good to see. Um, the board also visited Te Oranga, which is Kingsley, um, and we, had, we were shown through, and we're trying to reconnect with that community and seeing how we can help out with that community. So it was really lovely to actually go there and be welcomed and be shown around and see what we can do for them. Yep. And that's it. And that's it. Well, I'm sure Phil will want to move this, <laughs> and I'll second it in the absence of Mr Daniels, who, who did excuse himself, and he, he did. Yep. He has a personal cool. reason for not being here. Excellent. So thank you very much. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Okay. Done. And um, finally, Waimaro, <laughs> Kendleton, Waimaro, Hewitt Community Board. And I do apologise, Bridget, it's, it was actually mean making you last because this is your first time here as the chair of, um, of the community board. So, um, you know, but welcome. Oh, thank you. And thank you for your patience. No, um, that's all right. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Sounds good. No, I know everyone might be paying for some morning tea, so I'll whip through this. <laughs> um, and I have the lovely Marianne here beside me as well, just to help as well. But yes, so um, I guess an activity that happened in our uh, ward was the election um, for a new chair. And so very exciting to be taking on the role, um, but also very grateful and excited to have David Cartwright as our deputy chair as well. So it's great that we can continue working as an effective team. And while he's not here, he is here in spirit. And so I'll say a massive thank you to David um, for everything that he's done as chair. Uh, moving on to the next item is the draft LTP community engagement. So the board has been out and about holding information stalls and providing people with the opportunity to get the consultation document and the submission form and also to talk to the local elected members, members about the draft LTP. 
So we find that going out to where people are obviously is a way better result than holding drop-in sessions, which where people are expected to come. So it's about us getting out in the community. And we've been going out to Bishopdale, New World, Fendleton Library, Northwood, New World and Avonhead Mall. Um, and people have been stopping and talking to us, which is great, uh, with a range of issues which we've listed there. So things like library closing hours, cycleways, traffic issues, bus services, and the representation review. Um, there were a ranging views on various topics, and we are encouraging people to make sure they do a submission. We also had our school principals meeting. So the board had a great meeting on the 12th of March with all of the local school principals in the area. Not everyone could come, obviously principals are incredibly busy, um, but it was great to have them there, those that did come along. And safety issues um, regarding traffic around the schools was a big hot topic. So the board has asked council's traffic staff to work with us and the schools to see what can be done. Some issues were also raised around the protection around the protection of trees which are on some of the grounds of the schools and there was a bit of frustration from the schools around the bureaucracy and red tape in regards to having work done to the trees. So we will follow this up with council staff. Um, Allenvale School is a provider of education to children and young people with special needs and they talked to us about the transition to work program that they have for their older students which is a great program. But with the impacts of COVID-19 on local businesses and employers, they've seen a reduction of opportunities that are normally available to their young people. Um, and of course, there's also the exciting building project underway in our area as well, bringing together the Burnside Primary, Cobbin Intermediate and Allenvale School into one of um, the new campus on Island Road. And the schools were deemed rebuilds following the earthquake. So this project has been a long time coming. So it's really exciting. We also had a Sticks Living, um, a site visit, sorry, to the Sticks Living Laboratory Trust. This is an awesome group of people doing outstanding work um, on learning and research in the Sticks River catchment. So although their base is in the Hereward Ward, the work they undertake spans across the Papua Nui, Innes and coastal Burwood areas as well. But on this recent site visit, board members were able to hear a lot about the work they're doing in regards to water quality monitoring, restoring and protecting natural habitats and ecosystems, predator control, and the reintroduction of native species. Um, they run regular volunteering events, including a monthly bird monitoring program to record um, the number of individual water bird species. And they also run school education programs and summer student research scholarships for tertiary students. So, we're so grateful for the amazing work that they do in the area. And lastly, we also had the pleasure um, to sit down and have a chat with Sarah Pallet, who is the new MP for Islam. So nearly 90% of the Islam electorate is within the Fendleton Waimati Herewood board area. And we talked about some of the key issues in the area, and there was a real keen desire to work to, um, together to address some of these er um, issues, particularly those that require central government action. And I think it's just a really great example um, of us wanting to collaborate and um, catch up regularly. So I'm sure we'll be seeing more of Sarah in the future. So yeah, if you have any questions, happy to take them. Thank you. Now I presume okay. Sam you'd like to move this and James would like to second it. Are there any questions? Any discussion? <laughs> You're going to get away with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I'll put Thanks the everyone. motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those cool. opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great work. Right, we're adjourned now for morning tea. Um, and uh, if we could be back here at um, half past, that's 12 minutes. Enough time to grab a coffee. Thank you.
Morning. We haven't gone into the afternoon session. We've gone into a continuation of the morning session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're actually going to go to item 18 uh, so that we can um, address the naming of the Metro Sports Facility. Um, and that is because uh, we have Lynn um, Taika, who's joined us here today uh, to um, support uh, the Matapokari um, uh, uh, representation on the, on the gifting of the name. So um, that's very much appreci appreciated. So thank you, Lynn, for being here as well. So I'll hand over to you and... Um, Craig Hutchings. I'm the facility establishment manager at Council, and I'm joined by um, uh, uh, Lynn Tiaka, who's um, uh, representing Matter Popery. Uh, the purpose of this uh, report for Council is to consider a permanent name for Metro Sports Facility, which is currently the working title for the new recreation and sports facilities being constructed between Morehouse Road and Antigua Street. While the report contains all the background information regarding the name and the rationale for the recommendation, I would just like to take a moment to reinforce the link between the special name that local Renunga and Tainā Tahiriri have gifted. As the largest recreation and sports facility in New Zealand, this facility will encourage and promote physical wellbeing for all Cantabrians, support pathways for high-performance athletes, and importantly, increased participation rates in, in sport and recreation. The story of Parikyori, the gift and name, which I will shortly pass over to Lynn to talk about, will provide a means of inspiration. The use of recreation and sport as descriptors are important as they communicate the purpose of the facility. Recreation being activities done for enjoyment and not um, outside of work. Sport being activities being involved in physical exertion and skill in which people usually compete against each other. These words together, Parakuri Recreation and Sports Centre, will provide meaning, build a sense of pride in cultural identity and inspire the millions of customers that will visit the facility when it opens. And uh, I think an important part of that is the education of the, the name. So I'll pass over to Lynn and um, we'll actually start that process and, and Lynn will, will, will take you through some of that story. Tēnā koutou katoa, he mahi matakui kui kia koutou, kua whakarau i ka mai. Kia ora everyone, I'm here as a face of Matapōpore but also from Ngai Tu Ahuriri Raunanga and I'm a trustee of the Marae. Um, and Thinking about our name, and I give apologies from our upoko te maere tau, who's actually on the Mutton Bird Islands um, at the moment, seasonal food gathering, but he was the one who actually came up with the name, and um, I'll just walk, walk you through the PowerPoint presentation. I understand you have a copy, but we'll go through it. So the Metro Sports Facility um, promotes sporting excellence and physical wellness. From a Māori perspective, it also... Um, links to physical strength and agility, and these are all part of the core narrative thread of wellbeing. Traditional Māori existence demanded high physical ability of men and women alike to survive the transient subsistence way of life within the southern landscape and to survive as warriors. Physical and mental excellence is celebrated through the many traditional narratives that tell of the relationship between Māori and the environment and interdependent, interdependence of both for continued health and wellbeing. One such narrative from Ngai Tu Ahuriri tells the story of resilience, determination and agility. It is summarised in its simplest form in the following slides. Tūra Tahi was the founding chief of Kaya Poipa for Ngai Tu Ahuriri and Ngai Tahu in the North Canterbury area in the 1700s. So he's our main ancestor from the time Ngaitahu set foot in the South Island. One of his sons was named Parakiore, and he was known for his prowess, his agility and quick thinking. He was embroiled in a battle on the Moiraki beach. The invaders were close by. Parakiore and his wife were chased along the Moiraki beach where their pursuers caught up with them. They taunted him about his supposed fleetness of foot and how easy he had been to catch. 
Parakiori was not concerned and replied with a cryptic remark. Kia whati te tai, kia pao te tōrea, kia ina te harakeke a hine kakai. When the tide recedes, the tōrea, the oyster catcher, will strike. The flax of hine kakai burns. The above pepehao for Katoki was recited by Parakiori. It was a boast that they were never going to catch him because he was too fast for him. The proverb from Parakiori tells us that his speed was the same as, a, as an, a spark igniting dried flax. Māori would use dried flax as a fire starter, and like the tōrea, the oyster catcher, if Pari, Parakiori had moved too soon, he would have been slowed down by the surf and the tide washing onto the sand. So you actually have to know the environment and the landscape to, to survive well in, in the landscape. He then promptly lifted his wife onto his back and piggybacked her down the beach so quickly that he still outran his pursuers. So this is a Ngai Tu Ahuriri Ngai sto Naitahu story of endurance, agility and speed. Parakiori is a legend, a hero of the 18th century, and his proverb has been handed down from generation to generation. The story of Parakiori also tells the significance of understanding, understanding the environment we live in and our interdependence on the flora and fauna by becoming eco-literate about learning to read our environment visually and the physical landmarks and iconic features within our environment. Ngai Tu Ahuriri gifts, gifts this name for the Metro Sports Facility. Kia ora. Any questions? Kia ora. No, th thank you very much for the presentation because it, it really does um, provide a, a sort of a compelling story uh, around around the name and uh, and 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 the understanding of that significance of of knowing our environment. Um, but my question is is really for for our staff member yes. because um, uh, councillors um, obviously had a had a bit of a, a background briefing on this and there, there was a feeling that the word metro shouldn't disappear because it has become such a feature of the of the um, of the place itself mm -hmm. um, it isn't a, a local um, suburban community facility it is the metropolitan center mm -hmm. um, and uh, and there was a question as to whether um, Parakiori metro uh, recreation and sports mm -hmm. center would be an acceptable um, name. I, I just or think that me, metro from, sports. from a from a branding in, in my my view the branding and and we did as part of the document we we did consider that as an option uh, at looking at um, retaining that metropolitan and understand that it is a regional based f facility and all you know as opposed to our our local attractions. But um, um, from a branding perspective, it becomes quite difficult. From a signage pers perspective, it, it becomes quite difficult. And I think in the, the activities that are provided and the services that are provided uh, and an understanding that will attract regional and national events, the understanding what the facility is actually serving as a purpose will actually be achieved through through the services and programs and activities that, and events that are, that are provided as opposed to it having to be part of the name. Well, if that just makes it very long, then Metro Sports Centre, mm. mm -hmm. because then I mean in Parakiori Metro Sports Centre, um, actually less letters, um, mm -hmm. and and from the from the incredible um, uh, activities that it will attract, like national competitions and and potentially international or Trans Tasman mm. uh, competitions. Uh, which will become a regular feature of this place, and it's the sports activities that will will be the the standout of this facility, as opposed to the recreation. Um, uh, 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 um, uh, respectfully, the uh, the the facility, um, yes, a component of of it will be about sport, um, but in, but importantly for Cantabrians and the key purpose, one of the key objectives is to increase sport, um, people's participation and actually people, um, uh, the, the attraction in terms of recreation as I, as I explained before, in things that are not competitive and are not, uh, do, don't involve people competing against each other, 
the hydro slides, the leisure, the, 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 the leisure water, the aquatic sensory area spaces, the fitness spaces. There are so many spaces. Look, uh, I, it's it, unfair. It's unfair because yep. I, I thought that we'd, we'd had a discussion about yep. this the other day um, and that uh, this obviously wouldn't have been a surprise. Yep. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just getting a sense from uh, councillors if, if people are generally comfortable with what's up there. Um, uh, and the alternative is the is the paraki ori. I mean, I think there's the acceptance of the name, um, the gift, yep. uh, gratefully received. Um, but the the word metro is what people have understood about this place. It is our premium premier event centre, really for. Um, for both swimming and, um, but anyway, um, if there's a general feeling that um, that that's not the case, um, sure. I'm happy to foreshadow then um, the Metro Sports Centre if that's sure. Yeah, because okay. I, I, I think that'd be far more appropriate. Metro Metropolitan. Metro. Metro. I think that one of the things that um, I mean, I think that people will probably still continue in some ways to call it metro sports like they call Tūranga, you know, the central library, those kind of things. Um, I think that if we add metro sports as part of the official name, what we risk is people just dropping the parakiori part of it when they are naming it, um, where that should be the formal name. Um, Sorry, uh, look, uh, yeah. we did have a discussion about this the other day, and yes, it was an informal discussion, and uh, I, I may have misunderstood the extent of people's um, views. I thought I was representing the view of the, um, of the collective, but not. OK, Tim. Um, look, Naipuna Wai is known by everybody as Naipuna Wai, so I just think we kind of get overthinking and start, with the, especially with the European things, that whole lot of names, like the, the Recreation and Sports Centre, I mean that is so boring, let's be honest, mm. but everyone knows it's Metro Sports, but if we had a particular Metro Sports, I mean, that's just, everyone knows it's the Metro Sports, we've been talking about it for almost 10 years, and we gift the name as a real treasure, so I think to just keep it as simple as possible, Recreation and Sport, everyone knows it's Recreation and Sports, so Metro Sports, so I think the gifted name with Metro Sports, simple. Aaron? Yeah, so uh, well, I just had a, qu a question, if I can I still do yeah. a question? Yeah. yeah, was around the, um, the story that was just told in all the words that went with it, will that be in the foyer in that full form? Uh, yep. So we're, we're working with Matt Popery at the moment to, to look at all the, all the ways, whether it be video or right. um, uh, signage throughout the facility. So, so the answer is yes, and there will be other ways to tell the story as well. I can see a children's book, a digital yeah. story that's mm. that's told. I can in hear this. your voice telling it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm writing the book, so I'll let you know. <laughs> and and if, if it's if it's approved, uh, that there's you know there's there's a video piece that will come out and explain the story um, as part of our, mm. our our communications plan. Okay, I'm happy to move this the recommendation. There's up there. Okay, so it's been moved by Aaron, seconded by Sarah. Um, so, is there any debate? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. The same. Yeah. Okay, so that's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, can we go back to the minutes for the Audit and Risk Management Committee? Uh, moved by Sam, uh, seconded by Sarah. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Uh, Audit New Zealand Management Report 2019-20. Moved by Sam, seconded by James. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Health, so Health, Safety and Wellbeing Committee minutes. We take, it, take it as read. Happy to move. James has moved them. Any questions? I mean, sorry, any, a seconder, please. Mm. 
Sam, uh, Sam McDonald, I put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. The uh, next item is the uh, draft submission on Environment Canterbury's long-term plan. And just going from oh, the staff have, um, have added some additional text to address the points uh, that we have uh, been discussing um, both here at the meeting um, in relation to uh, clean air uh, and in terms of strengthening the wording, um, also strengthening the wording around nitrates and groundwater, um, and, and also at my request, um, a, a, an a additional wording about the free shuttle, because the free shuttle is something that uh, our own residents have raised um, time and time again. We've tried to get it included within the um, regional uh, public transport uh, plan. It is there, but there is the sense that it's the chicken and egg. They say that it needs to come after the buildings are built, and we're saying no, actually it needs to be there now because um, that idea of making it easy to get around um, in the central city um, and, and filling that, that sort of bit of a gap in the donut um, uh, would, would, would certainly help as well. So, um, so th we've got this. Do we want to go through? To perhaps if I just hand over to staff and you talk about the, the changes because everyone has seen the. And thank you for such a speedy turnaround. Yes. That's no trouble. Um, if I'd known you were going to put it on the screen, I would have tidied it up a little bit more in the no, five fun. minutes that we, that we were um, frantically working it on it. It just shows how quickly you've worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to, to deal with the nitrate issue, first at the top of the screen you can see the existing paragraph 18, and then the suggestion is that we um, strengthen that by adding um, in the middle of the paragraph that we are concerned to see rather than simply noting the emerging trend of rising concentrations. And then at the end, um, we uh, welcome clarification of the Regional Council strategy for addressing this emerging trend. And then finally, we suggest that increased monitoring would be clearly required once nitrate levels approach 50% of that maximum acceptable value. And that wording at the very end makes the point that the MAV is set in terms of short-term exposure and it's not a level um, that considers what happens if you're exposed over the long term. Um, so the, there's sort of options in there for how sort of strong you want this paragraph to be in terms of raising these issues with ECAN. Right, Sarah? No, you're not Sarah, you're Pauline. Thank you. <laughs> I think we need to be really strong. Um, my concern is that we do, we do have a New Zealand study going on at the moment on the um, maximum allowable level being different from that set by WHO and a lot of research. So I'm wondering if we could put something in about ECAN being flexible about emerging evidence as it, as it emerges around the, um, the lowering of the maximum allowable value because we keep referring to who there and that is extremely high and we know that, particularly when you see evidence on the macroinvertebrates which is down around 1.3. I just don't, I think we're still sitting looking at 50% of the MAV is still too high as far as we're concerned. We, so yeah. if we could find some wording about ECAN being flexible around changing standards or levels. We have um, got this advice also from <coughs> Three Waters, so I'm just one, we're just thinking about whether that's actually in the drinking water um, standards, so we just need to check that with Helen, um, but we can mm. certainly put something in there about flexibility. I think it might be a responding good idea. to future changes. Yes, exactly, yes. and I th and that yes. is what we've discussed. It's about making sure that we're informed by that emerging yeah. research yeah. and responsive and flexible to that. So we can because I mean, fifty percent of the um, so value now at eleven point three is what six point seven five or something, which is ridiculously high. 
still. But so, I mean, we, we're in the right space. So, yeah. I mean, we can get the sign off of the final detail of the wording. We don't need to wordsmith yeah. it here. I, I would like to change the words as set for short term exposure to um, has been established based on acute exposure. So, uh, you know, there's some technical tidy up that Absolute, I'd just like to yeah. see. And we've sort of just been um, circulating it around Diane and Sarah yeah. to make sure that we've got that really. Accurate. You just get, we'll just get the wording tidied yep. up. So I don't, yeah, I, I think else. that generally people mm -hmm. are comfortable with the proposed changes yep. in a general it's sense. A and I think the wording is sufficient for us to tidy up the wording before it. Um, we go back to the resolution. Do you want to deal with the other two bits? Or? Sorry? Do you want to deal with the other elements? Yeah, well? you will deal with, yeah, paragraph five. Um, oh yes, no, yeah. uh, paragraph, we'll run through no. the res, sorry, no, carry on. Rest, uh, so just a, um, stop. The, the paragraph about the free, um, yeah, oh. did you want me to comment on that? Um, so this is another bit I would have tidied up if I'd known it was going on the screen. Um, I, I, our initial suggestion I guess is just to add um, those red words to the end of existing paragraph five to say, in addition, we support further work on the affordability of public transport as part of the review of bus fares, including consideration of free services. But we're um, after the, the shuttle in the central city. It's the central city uh, shuttle. So right. if we could just put um, okay. and the reinstatement of the, um, of the free uh, central city, city shuttle, that, okay. will, that will do. So, yeah. Okay, sorry, I didn't understand. No, that. no. And um, the clean air. So we understand that was raised in the public forum and wanted to point out the uh, strengthened wording that we added to paragraph 32 following the staff briefing on uh, the 26th of March when we met with um, councillors to discuss the draft submission. Uh, the feedback we had then that was that that um, paragraph just wasn't strong enough, and so we've added the red wording in there to the draft that you have attached to the report. Right, so that, uh, people are generally comfortable with the change in direction there. Um, Yanni? Well, I, mean, I mean, given what we heard this morning, and I I mean, I was kind of on the impression ECAM were doing more in that quarry space, but I think what we heard this morning is there's still huge gaps. So I was a bit concerned um, with we support the steps they've taken to improve monitoring around air quality around quarries. I just don't know how robust what they're currently doing is, um, and thought we may want to be stronger, particularly around that. But I mean, I think fundamentally, um, we, we do want to support a level of service so that people can see what the expected response time would be if they do log those complaints. Um, and it's not just quarries, it is, it is dust as well. Um, and I know um, there's been some concern, but I, I just also wanted to check on the, on the free shuttle because previously we've been advised that we cannot be anti-competitive with existing contract providers. So we can't run a service that's free where companies have so contracts no, we, to deliver bus can services. We run where there's no service. Yeah, so where there's no service, but the obviously shuttle. the bus routes have changed quite significantly. Well, that'd be free to respond, wouldn't Yanni, it? the shuttle doesn't run on a, an existing bus route. Sorry, M Manchester Street is the key bus corridor it now. It doesn't have to go on Manchester it didn't Street. Used to I'm be. just saying, Sorry. reinstate the shuttle. It's not a it's not a scheduled service. Oh, I so just wonder, like, I support I, Look, I've the, read the act at Yarni. It doesn't, right. it complies. Okay, right? that, that's good, because when we tried to get an east-west one, we were repeatedly told that we couldn't do it because of that. But Correct. I mean, because just, they have only, scheduled services running east to west. So well, they have north-south as well. But the other thing, just in that regard, is when we were doing the car parking um, policy strategy, the idea of, for example, free buses within the four avs, like a zone zero. So I just... I mean, I don't want to rule out that option as well because I think both deserve to be looked at, but can we make it a little bit wider just to include the ability for people just to get on the bus within the, you know, go travel within the four hours? That's what it means. Would you like to add 
Yeah, well, I mean, it, you know, like it might be a better way of doing it, but we'd obviously need to get advice on that. But. So we're, we're generally comfortable with the direction of it. We can wordsmith the final sign-off, um, and if you want to change it so that the final wording um, agreed between the... Um, the um, Mayor and Chief Executive, yep. I mean, we'll just get advice on it, but we'll just sign off the final wording. And um, the second question is, is do, does the council want this to be um, uh, heard? And um, does it? Do they want the council to present the submission to ECAN, or are they quite happy that we just um, forward the submission to them? Just forward it to them. Yep. Well, that, that, that's the thing, is, is that are we going to agree that it be heard in support of its submission? So, um, I think we should be heard. Okay, so, um, so, 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 Andrew, are you happy to move the approval and agree that it be heard in support and delegate? Oh, you can't move it because it says the Mayor and Deputy Mayor yeah. determine representation. Pauline, move it. Seconded by... Seconded by Melanie. Okay, Aaron. Yeah, just the only question I had when I went through the whole thing was, why did we not mention the incredible rates rise? Did you mean the twenty-four percent rise? We don't talk about the golden elephant in the room. Twenty-four percent of a very small base. We don't thought they were smaller than average. Twenty-four percent is twenty-four percent. But that's like saying that our council's budget's tiny compared to the government, so we just Sorry, put I wasn't up at the meeting where this was discussed, was but I think no. that it was made relatively clear that there was to be a um, focus on the issues. That, that, is, that is an issue because it's been that's about the only thing that's been raised with me by members of the public is. Yes, oh my I've goodness. read your post. And have you told it's them not, the actual correct question. information or it's, the misinformation? It's not a question. I mean, it, the, no, the, real, the, right the, the issues are in relation to the to to the um, to, to to what they are doing. So it's the it's the programs of work. So as I understood. You know, councillors were quite comfortable with going down that track. If you want to, um, I, yeah. I've I got I've got some wording, Leanne. I could send through. We can just add that in. I'm sorry, but some councillors here who are not happy with us, we're not at the workshop, and so if they were not at the workshop, that's your problem. I don't care. Yes, we we had a, we had a workshop with um, Ethan to discuss yeah. the issues with there. them. I, I wasn't at it, so. Yeah. Um, and I, I can comment. I mean, I led the pre-discussion before we met with the ECAN governors where everybody was comfortable that we wouldn't comment on the rate rise. Um, and certainly that was the basis of the discussion with the ECAN governors. And even though there was some discussion in that forum, um, the result was that the people in the, the, the people in the room were comfortable that we wouldn't um, make comment on the rate rise. Um, and there was interesting information that was given by the ECAN governors at that meeting around the rate rise and the effect on Christchurch residents versus the figure which has seen so much um, attention in the media. I've just sent through to Joe some wording potentially we could look to include. Okay, well th that can be put up as an amendment, so um, sorry? Yep. Um, thanks so much. I'm just thinking about the, the types of things that we have put in our submission about the outcomes that we're seeking <coughs> and the issues that we've raised. Is the work that we have asked to be done and the focus that we have asked for from ECAN, which is, tends to be additional work, is that likely to be consistent with a lower rates increase um, when we've been asking well, for additional work? Can we see what I've got? It's a, it's a question for staff, actually. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, but it would answer your question really easily. Yeah. I've, I've asked staff. You usually ask for the staff, answer for the staff. Yeah. So, Sarah, the question is that the feedback we've provided, would that result in a lower no, is it consistent? No, the staff they, can't they, answer that, that question these... because they're obviously going to do, as we are going to do, a juggling exercise. After we've listened to submissions, mm -hmm. um, so I mean, the, the reason that I don't support us making a submission on the rates rise, but I do around the technical detail, and I would have been quite happy for this merely to have been submitted. But that, but that's by the by. The, the real reason that I don't um, agree with us doing that is that that is an issue that will be discussed with ECAN as a matter of course after hearing submissions from the residents who are going to be asked to make that. 
so make those um, payments of their rates. And so why should we collectively, a group of individual ratepayers, which is what we would be here, make a submission on that subject here? I mean, the, the reality is, is that we can't represent the view of the, of the city or even an understanding of the view of the city, given that, that there's going to be a juggling act made at the end about what and the rates implications will now, be. So if it's easy to put it as an amendment, and then if it hmm? gets lost, it gets lost. Doesn't it feel shadow because it's been moved and seconded? No, it's Maybe an amendment. We can move an amendment, um, for goodness sake. Yeah, yeah. We're concerned by the proposed rate increases across the region, noting that this will vary by rateable unit. We would request that as elected members you direct Environment Canterbury staff to reduce this additional rating burden by finding further operational savings. We believe a significant reduction in this case would demonstrate a fiscal... It's not really our reduction. role to talk about the rest of the region, oh. though. I, 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 um, yeah, it is, it, it is an amendment, but it, it's very rude. <laughs> Well, no, but it's it, it is actually poor, poor responsible. It's not it's not an appropriate amendment. It's actually not appropriate for us as a council to make a submission um, on this uh, point when they are out hearing directly from their residents right across the region, as we are mm -hmm. for ours. Mm -hmm. There will be a juggling act that will happen at the end of it where essentially the, the weight of submissions will be considered. People will look through all of the issues. Um, I mean, if, the, if, the, um, if, the, if this simply said that we note that all of us are operating at times of, um, that require fiscal restraint mm. uh, due to the challenges that we all face, then I'm good with that, but I think asking um, the uh, Environment Canterbury uh, members to do this in the context of the um, broader responsibilities. I just don't think that it's, it's right. It's not our role to speak on behalf of the rest of Canterbury, just for our residents. We, 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 We're can't. Not, we can't be concerned about stuff across the region. We're only concerned about our stuff. Anyway, um, I don't know. I'm, I look, I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, adjourn this item and I'm going to take advice as to the um, legality and appropriateness of the of the amendment, I don't care. I want legal advice. I want proper advice as to the nature of this amendment because I believe that we are not under the local government act able to actually put that amendment um, to the council um, today. So, um, if if I could just. Uh, uh, um, uh, I, th I think I'll just move on to the next item on the agenda. I'll just let this lie on the table until we get... I'm just going to adjourn this item and come back to it in a minute, but if you could just get me some advice on that. We'll just move into the Central City Projects, High Street, Cashel Chum and High Street Tram Extension. This is a technical document, yes, um, moved by Jake, seconded by James. Any discussion? I'll put um, Aaron. Just, just a question. Um, with, uh, is there any spare um, traffic light poles? Because we like to upcycle in our ward that we could move to Hewood Road. <laughs> that are coming out just in the interest of um, saving materials. Oh, yes. Noted. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Yanni, you're not going to move onto the items on the PX paper, are you? No, no. I put some questions through. Um, I really just wanted to understand around the um, the just the whole traffic modelling for the new state multi-use arena. That's the next item. Sorry, that is not an item that we're dealing with on this matter. Sorry. These are the, the decisions that we have already made as a council. These are the technical amendments um, or resolutions that have to be passed to implement Yeah, those I get decisions. that, but there's changes. So if you go to page 162... Yani. Okay, well, um, I, I'm, I'm just not going to put up with this anymore. I've said to you, that is an item to be dealt with in the next part of the meeting. This is in the public the section of the agenda. My question related to 5.5, which is in the public section of this agenda, mm -hmm. on page 
one six two. I don't see what's what's not fair about it being raised. Item 5.2, so there were 5.5, .5, item 5.5 .5 on, on this agenda? It's to do with the detail under section 5. There's a number of changes that have been um, advised to us so and there's a number of comments around things being either further investigated as part of future work. Yep, so there are no changes as a result of 5.4 or 5.5. .5. We are just advising the council that the hearings panel um, resolution for us to undertake this will be undertaken we haven't forgotten about it and it is being done as part of future work that is planned as part of the ltp yeah sorry what, what i was here. trying to understand though in terms of this design what thinking has gone in to the impact of the new multi-use arena this because design. if you go down manchester street like clearly what we thought was going to happen i mean i've talked to bus drivers who've got delays the traffic's not working as i thought it, it would and as we thought would be Devoid, beneficial we've already so we do design. understand that we've already done be, the design. it was designed it, this was designed and put through as part of a design we knew the multi use arena was in the future and we have done that the the we've the actions and the and the um oh, what's what I'm looking for? I've lost a word, sorry. That how that intersection will um, run, run work in the future yes. will be considered as, <laughs> as part of a future project, Litchfield sorry. and Dress, which is in the draft LTP. Yeah. So what she said. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so that's been asked and answered. I'm not having any badgering. Awesome. Thank you. Um, is there any other point I'm going to... Mike? I, I will, We're in debate. Uh, I will support this uh, because it's just the technical resolutions on a decision that council made last yeah, no. term. Yep. Um, so I will say yes to it. But I do think, as a council, we missed a huge opportunity to get some really excellent outcomes to High Street. Um, and I think the compromise we did was actually too much. Yeah. I'll speak to it as well. Cool. Yeah. Um, like. I think if you take a high level view, there's been a lot of changes that have been done. We've put some transitional stuff along Ferry Road. We've got a lot greater assessment now of the impact of some of the potential developments as well as some new developments. And I think, you know, fundamentally, we can't just keep putting in projects that were done as part of the accessible city or the inaccessible city. Um, we can't just keep doing them. Like, we actually need to take a stock take of how the traffic is functioning in the central city. From my observation and from people I've talked to, there's a lot of dysfunction with things that were supposed to work in a certain way that aren't. There's probably some really good stuff that is working well, but clearly I think with the amount of development going on, particularly with a new multi-use arena where we've just got additional funding on our LTP that we're consulting on, we should actually think about really good connections for cycling and pedestrians as a big picture rather than just doing each little block on a block by block basis. So my concern is that there, there seems to be a lack of an integrated traffic, pedestrian cycling planning for this whole quadrant of the city. Some of the improvements that we were told that would be beneficial like Manchester Street. I mean, I've talked to bus drivers who said they spent 15 minutes sitting in gridlock because a few cars get in into the middle of Manchester Street. Clearly that's not a functional uh, priority for PT and nor do I think it's functional for people that are accessing the city. So. I'm not going to support this today. I think we're missing an opportunity to look at the big picture. Uh, I think things have moved on since the accessible city plans were put in place. Um, and we actually need to step back and think about the cumulative impact of all the proposed development or existing development that's happened in this area since and come up with a bit much better coordination. Tom. Thank you. Look, I don't think there's actually too much to worry about because because of uh, three anonymous complaints over two years with regards to the gravel car parks, and it seems to be a want around this uh, table to get rid of them, there'll be less traffic anyway. Thank you. Thank you. I will put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Yeah, I'm opposed. Thank you. Um, that's carried. We'll move on to the next item. Uh, public street enclosures policy level four enclosure applications. I'm really happy to move this. Seconded by Andrew. 
Any discussion? So it's like, get, I didn't get an answer. Sorry, uh, sorry, you, you're asking a question on the Riverside Market. Yeah, I put some questions in ahead of the meeting yesterday. Sorry, I haven't. Um, sorry, uh, Richard, you're at the end of the table. I presume that you've got Yanni's questions. No. <laughs> Yanni, would you like sorry. to share your questions with Richard, please? So, um, the three questions I had were, I was just wondering, like, um, obviously the Riverside Market's fantastic, it's, it's really popular and well used. I, I was just trying to understand, I wasn't quite clear from the report around that the paving that's there, um, who, who takes responsibility for the maintenance? So I was trying to understand, does our maintenance budget get reduced and they pick up the cost of maintaining the expensive paving? And if so, or, or do we get additional revenue that then goes into maintaining it? I, I wasn't clear on that. That was probably the biggest concern. But the other concern was just to understand from a value add point of view to the development, um, I, I guess, what that does in terms of rentable space. Does it enable more space to be rented at a higher value? And is our charging in accordance with that? Or how do we work out what's a fair assessment? Um, answer to the second question is yes, we do charge them for that, the same as we charge anyone else. Um, I can't speak to how we go about doing that, but it's a consistent charge across uh, the central city for people who are using part of the public space, whether it be roads or something else. Right. So yes, we do charge them for that. But the concern, obviously, this is quite different to what's currently permitted in our policy. The, the structure is more but, significant. Yeah, the charge is still the same as I understand it, but um, it's not dissimilar to what you'd see outside the terraces, for instance, where um, the design is different because you haven't got the um, you haven't got the two and a half metre space adjacent to the terraces. However, when you look at where the um, buildings finish and then the enclosures go into the Oxford Terrace area, that's not dissimilar to what this might look like. The point I'd like to stress in this is that these are um, conceptual plans and we're still working through exactly what the final designs might look like with the Riverside representatives, so hence the reason why we've sought the council delegate authority to the head of transport as opposed to, because these things might be modified through discussions with Riverside reps, so um, it's conceptual, um, will look something like this, but, but perhaps not exactly the same. All right. And the, ma the, the maintenance issues? So in terms of maintenance, we maintain um, Oxford Terraces. It's, it's part of the, the, the transport network, so um, it falls under the um, HEBs do the central city streets, so we fall under their contract for doing that. Uh, we, we do have a, an agreement, a broad agreement with, with Riverside around a whole range of different things, as we do other parts of the central city, so we work collaboratively with them and others. Um, to ensure that you know we get the best outcomes for the city. So, but is, sorry, is, is this the section that they are leasing or, or have a license to occupy will, will basically come under their maintenance regime? So, I presume that's a part of the uh, that we're not current so, that we wouldn't maintain. So, in terms of um, their say for rubbish and other things, so we manage the rubbish bins, which is outside. We've got some big yeah. belly type bins out there, plus some normal bins. We manage those. They would manage something like rubbish, which is uh, left on their tables. So that's right. something that they would yeah. do. Um, so there's components that they would manage and there's okay. components that we would manage. I guess what I was of. really interested in is it's very expensive paving that's been put down here. Yep. And just to ensure that there's adequate maintenance occurring and the stuff that's licensed to occupy yes. but obviously it needs to be of a certain standard or consistent and yep. it needs to probably include I, I think we had to depreciate it i'm not sure but i know at the time there was concern raised about the cost ongoing cost of maintenance so i just would hope that that's factored into whatever agreement and, and maintenance regime is put in place so in terms of what we charge them, as I, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll be charging them the same as we do other central city businesses who yeah. occupy public space. Um, in terms of maintaining the, the transport asset underneath that, that would still fall within our obligation. However, if they were to damage that, then that would be a conversation okay. that we would have with them. 
Thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Mike. Thank you. Um, look, I say you know the conceptual drawings are, are good, but you know is this actually the reality of what we're going to see? And I guess under this um, level, they can actually have it fully enclosed, this public space. So, look, the, the, as we've tried to outline in the report, um, the, the outdoor dining is regulated by the by the public places bylaw on the public street enclosures policy 2006. That policy is currently up for review. The way that policy is structured is you have levels one, two, and three, which are delegated to head of transport or the um, CE. So this is what we call a, a level four enclosure because it doesn't fit within the policy, and hence we are seeking council approval. So that is something where it may be fully enclosed, but I don't believe that that is their intention, and as that's part of the um, conversation we need to have with the Riverside representatives. Uh, about what parts of it would be fully enclosed, if indeed they are. So the intention would be that, um, from their perspective, um, you know, if you look at towards this direction, so to the west, um, they might want that fully enclosed for parts of the year or parts of the day, you know, particularly when there's inclement weather, and so that to provide for outdoor dining. But there's going to be um, foot traffic between the building per se and the outdoor dining area across the 2.5 metre strip. So you wouldn't really want that part fully enclosed. So that's a discussion that we need to have with them about their intent. The south part, I think, you know, and northern parts are, are slightly different again. So, um, but to answer your point around yes, does it enable that, that would be the intention of the council delegation to the head of transport today, and that would be the detail that we would uh, negotiate with the Riverside reps about the how and the when, and what would it look like. Mm. Sarah, question. Thanks. Um, from the drawings, which look gorgeous, it does look like the um, there's there's a significant narrowing of that just normal pedestrian thoroughfare kind of space. Mm -hmm. Um, once you've got a sort of more permanent kind of structure there. Um, that's still technically a drivable space too, and I'm assuming loading vehicles and things will be coming in within the set hours. Um, what risk is there to damage to, uh, not just these structure, but people, but the, um, the, you know, the rain gardens, those kind of things. We often see, you know, the core trees are being knocked by a truck, those kind of things, where there's no comeback, council has to, ratepayers have to pay for <coughs> it. Um, and with the significant narrowing, what, what are the risks to that kind of stuff? So you're not talking about the 2.5 metre strip adjacent to the building itself, you're talking about the... Um, four metre. The, the, the four metre area slightly yeah, yeah. to the west of where they want the outdoor dining. Yeah. yeah. So it's, look, um, we, we really don't want vehicles, it is a public road, but we don't want vehicles going through there because it is heavily pedestrianised and, and sometimes there's quite a bit of pedestrian other furniture there from Riverside. Yeah. Um, there is loading spaces outside uh, on Litchfield Street, so we encourage um, the, the loading of goods and for that to occur on Litchfield Street as opposed to, because it's very close to Riverside and they can get access around the back, um, as opposed to trucks driving up and down that strip. Um, it's not something we try and encourage, but at the moment, Council's having that conversation around Oxford Terrace and what hours it is currently open, and um, that'll be a decision of Council as to when um, the whole of Oxford Terrace will be open for delivery vehicles, um, because this, at the moment it's quite... But this particular section's much narrower. It is with, narrower, with this, yep, with the this, trucks and can Especially stall. with the new structure and stuff in. Um, that, that, that four metre strip will still be kept as a, as, as a four metre strip, so you know, vehicles could still negotiate it, but, but it is certainly getting very busy when you look at all the other stuff, which is um, potentially spilling out onto it. So, look, it's not something we encourage, but currently, um, you know, they can legally use that. So, I'm just concerned that if you get to the point of actually enclosure, there's nowhere for pedestrians to go. There's the rain gardens on one side, there's a, an enclosure on the other side, and a truck going past. There's and no way for them to actually move either side. Yeah, so you, you've still got the two and a half metre strip adjacent to the building, and then you've got the ag rock adjacent to. But if it's Park. enclosed, you can't get to that two and a half metre strip. Yes. But there's still walkway. There'll still the whole area wouldn't be enclosed. There'd be walkways along there. Yeah. Okay. 
It'll be a sheltered walkway. Right, well, um, we'll move on to the debate and I'll open that up. I was actually looking forward to this item on the agenda more than any other item on the agenda today. It has a very practical application, mm -hmm. which it says this doesn't qualify for policy under our existing policy, so can you please delegate it to the Head of Transport mm -hmm. to decide whether to approve the licence? Go for it, Richard. You've got my full blessing. <laughs> I just think that it's a fantastic thing. Riverside has transformed the central city. It has made it an exciting destination, an amazing place to go. And, uh, and I, I went past there um, over the Easter weekend and uh, it was just jam-packed with people. There were thousands of people poured into the area just enjoying themselves on a beautiful, beautiful, hot, sunny weekend. So um, I, I just am incredibly grateful to what Richard uh, uh, Peebles and Mike Pekaski and the rest of the team have done down there. Um, I trust the organisation to do the right thing um, in relation to this licensing arrangement. It's an important uh, decision, but it's one that can be made by delegation, and that's mm. going to make it a much more direct um, relationship between the organisation and the Riverside market, and that's going to make a real difference. So thank you very much for the paper. Uh, Tim and then Sarah. And yeah, just for a moment there, I kind of thought, you know, like listening to the questions, why would you do business in Christchurch? But um, I'd have to say, this is fantastic. I totally agree with the Mayor, um, and I think it's best left with staff, and uh, good luck. I think it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, and the thing is, like, I completely agree. My, um, my concerns over the, the impact are to do with the volume of cars down there. So outside in this space on Oxford Terrace, there used to be a lot of on-street car parking. And um, Riverside is one of the best examples in the entire city as to uh, why it's actually best to remove the on-street parking, because you get a much greater pedestrian amenity. You know, this was built in a space where they knew that there would be no on-street car parking. There's off-street car parking available nearby. And it really does show the contrast about um, what is possible when you focus on people and people space. And it really highlights the lost opportunity that we have just seen in High Street. Um, so, Andrew. Andrew? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, if there's, if there's one thing that's been a game changer in the development of the central city, it's Riverside. And we see the um, large number of people sitting out there, outside there on the grass and chairs and tables and consuming food that they've bought from Riverside and generally enjoying themselves and creating an excellent atmosphere right in the heart of the central city. If there's one thing that we know about Christchurch, it's that it's a city with four seasons and that we know outdoor dining operates very differently in the winter than it does in the summertime, which involves the need for creating some pseudo indoor space areas where there can be heating, shelter and so on. Um, I'm sure that under the delegation that we're giving Richard, assuming this passes, he will fully take into account um, any conflict between or any opportunity for um, pedestrian, cyclists and motor vehicle movements. Um, and I absolutely agree that what we are doing here is creating a space for people. Um, but certainly listening to the answers to questions, there should be space for all of those activities to take place safely at the same time as making this an attractive year-round um, destination for outdoor dining and outdoor use. So I'm excited about this, but I also understand the concerns. Very confident, Richard, that you will um, take account of all of the things that have been raised as you exercise the delegation that hopefully we're about to give you. Um. Mike, and then well, who was the other one? No one? Just Thank Mike. you. And, and look, on, on face value, when you look at what's in front of us, the conceptual drawings, this actually looks like a really good outcome. I am concerned, though, of actually what potentially it could become once you start enclosing this space. I mean, we're saying, I guess, seeing a creep of um, you know, private business taking over the public realm, which does concern me. Um, and then also the adverse effect of actually isn't it starting to squeeze more people into a smaller corridor and what actually effect that, that will have. So uh, I like what's in front of me, but I am very concerned about actually where this could be heading for, for the city. 
um, uh, of Phil and, and Pauline. Pauline. Um, I, I, the Riverside guys have, have created a fantastic asset for Christchurch, and if we can help for the whole city, and if we can help them by delegating Richard this to do this, I just think um, go go hard. It's, it's good. It's more, more and faster. Pauline? Yes, I agree. This, and, and the way they've thought out this design, including the movable planters and, and the lighting and the, the louvers that will open and close, I just think that they do things really well. Um, I think I'm happy to delegate it to Richard because he seems like a pretty reasonable sort of bloke here, so I think he'll do it all right. <laughs> and um, just to call out there to Ben and Jerry's, if you haven't tried the vegan ice cream, you're missing out on something. It is amazing. So I'll be supporting this today. Okay, Aaron? Yeah, I'll be supporting it, and I would encourage you to try the um, Cherry Garcia rather than the vegan. It's the better ice cream. Uh, but that aside, um, picking up on Mike's point, um, if this is what business creeping into the public space looks like, let's hope that happens a lot more around the city because there's a lot of dead public space. Okay. Right, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. On to the Mayor's monthly report. Um, it, unlike usual, it actually has a couple of additional um, uh, recommendations with it this month. Um, it has the uh, a, 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 um, a, a, a request for an endorsement for the nomination of Principal Advisor Community Partnerships and Planning um, Claire Phillips to the Royal Commission on Inquiry Implementation Oversight advisory group, which is an advisory group to the government, um, and uh, also adopting the resolution, Just to, um, it's a shareholders resolution required for the um, B-based name change to venues, Otto Tahi. Uh, in my report, I've uh, done what, I've, what I always do, which is um, highlight some of the features of the month, but because it was the month of March, it was in the, it, it was, um, it's in retrospect, um, I won't go over um, any of those details. I have used the, the V-based change of name, though, to highlight uh, the, um, the, the major change that they have made to shift to uh, local products. So catering is all in-house now. Uh, Venues Ototahi now sources 71% of all food and beverage product from the region. Previously, it was only 5%. Mm. Um, the remaining 29% of products are sourced from the rest of the South Island, 7% from the North Island, 16%, um, and only 6% of products are now from overseas. Previously, 30% of all products were from overseas. So it's an incredible um, turnaround. Um, so in real terms, this means 40 local suppliers uh, to our local venues, mo most of whom are new in the, new in the last year. So it is a great turnaround. So. I'm, I'm really impressed with that. And the one other thing that I'll draw your attention to is a fantastic launch that I went to uh, the other night um, in Common. Uh, and that directly arises out of the events of the 15th of March 2019. And as you know, the Royal Commission has asked us to think deeply about what creates social cohesion. Um, and there's a group of people, and Claire's been amongst them, uh, have worked on a, a right across agencies, right across communities, um, to develop this tool called In Common, and it encourages Christchurch residents to reach out across cultures and faiths to make Canterbury a better place where everyone feels that they belong. And, uh, and if you go onto the website, you'll see some lovely little stories with images of people, um, uh, you, you can see some of them in, the, in, in what I've presented here today, uh, but, but actually when they get together, it's what they have in common that uh, is the conversation starter. And uh, it's, a, it's a great um, tool, really, for um, developing those conversations. So I've, I've, I've got the website there for you. Please feel free to spread it far and wide because it's a it, it's just a great opportunity for us to to do something about um you know uh, valuing our differences which make us unique but valuing all that we have in common as well so um 
So I'm happy to move my uh, report plus the uh, additional recommendations. And does, you're happy to second it, Jimmy Chen? Uh, any que questions or debate? Comments? Yep. I kind of. I, I just, um, <coughs> just want to say thanks for um, taking the time to write really full reports on your mural activities. I know that um, you're probably the first mayor to do this kind of mirror report and it's it's really valued and highlights a wide range of things that are um, often unseen by us or by others and um, there's a huge number of additional events and things that you go to on the city's behalf so I just want to say thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Aaron. Oops. <laughs> yeah, I endorse um, Sarah's words there um, uh, because, yeah, you do do a lot of work and you, um, you're also very well read. You read a lot of stuff. Um, a bit nerdy, but um, <laughs> it's one of those things. You said you like reading it. Um, I just want to bring up the, or add to point three up there. It was your suggestion that you put uh, nominate Claire and yeah. the entire table when we had that briefing, um, supported that and were just almost overwhelmed that that was the person that you put forward and chose. There's an incredible amount of respect around this table for Claire and the work she does in our community. And she is one of the un unsung heroes of the city that has taken this city through one of its darkest points. So mm. thank you. Thank you for, thank you for saying so. that. Uh, Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, based on uh, Mayor's report, I think uh, paragraph three is where we were very important, you know, it means the kind of strong signal, you know, the our council, particular Kuala City Council, you know, we would like to in response to the uh, Royal Commission, the, their inquiry the report and the 44 uh, recommendations, and the clear failures you know, uh, over the last uh, possibly at least uh, 20 years, not only in council, but in the MSD summer area, she has lots of uh, uh, working experience and also engage wider uh, communities. So we in those names, you know, is uh, I think is is a greater benefit to our uh, council. But uh, regarding to the the their advice groups, their particular emphasis, you know, they would like to embrace all kinds of the the, the people, you know, can be uh, joined together, you know, the, to in response to help the. Government for the implementation, government implementation, uh, the the plan, etc. It's not a crew. No, only one person just want to let everybody know. The other one is particular riverside market. You know, let's they done the greater job because why they particular have in their the level one specific area would like like to the encourage as a community group. They might have a function, event, you know, activity in there. I, I, I myself, I attend those uh, function events for over, even over the last uh, month, uh, three, three, three times, you know, like Irania, the New Year, uh, Japanese one, and also the, uh, the income, uh, etc. you know, they've done the greater job. So I think uh, possibly, you know, if uh, some uh, commun community or business done the greater job, I suggest whether the council consider, you know, presenting in the kind of certificate appreciation, et cetera, just to encourage, you know, that's very, very crucial because what we always uh, uh, emphasize this city is a diversified, inclusive, you know, the, 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 the harmonious city, but they want to, you know, fully the, into the practice compliant totally with the council, the community outcome. Resilient community. That's fantastic. So that's good pattern. This is my view. Thank you. So I could tell the. Oh, sorry. I was going to close the, um, um, the debate. And I was just going to add um, that uh, Claire uh, is, a, is a fantastic um, choice for this role because of her knowledge and experience um, in the Muslim community. But the fact that too, she's built up such trust and she knows um, what's important to those people. And uh, so. Uh, I think it's a, a wonderful recommendation and very supportive. Thank I'm just you. going to close off because um, I just noticed who hadn't actually read the report when um, Jimmy started talking about the Riverside Market. So on page 20, uh, I refer to the fact that um, over the last year, Riverside Market has supported community events as part of the Cultures of Aotearoa series, and they have been hosting these events. Um, I've been to most of them. I think Jimmy's been to all of them. 
uh, and his idea of actually recognising the Riverside market, um, it, it, that they actually did receive um, a presentation at In Common um, for the launch of In Common there the other night. Um, but I think we should, we too should. So I'll take that as an action and bring that back in the next report because I think we should honour them uh, for what they've done. And um, and uh, I, I was going to say too that um, Claire's nomination was supported from uh, members of the Muslim community, Bree family. So I just wanted to make the point that this is a community-wide. Uh, support for her. So thank you very much for the comments that you've made and they will be passed on to her. So I will put the motions. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. And now we will return um, to the uh, next question of the draft submission on Environment Canterbury's long-term plan because disappointingly for me I've been told that I have to accept this dreadful amendment. It's healthy um, for democracy. So, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, um, if there's a second. Uh, no, there will be a seconder, I'm sure. Who would like to second it? Aaron will. <laughs> Once Sam gave him a nudge across the table, he was happy to oh, happy to apply. <laughs> Nothing like a bit of uh, passive pressure from the chair, either, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I was I was expecting it anyway. Um, so, um, but and and you are absolutely wedded to the words, because I mean, Ian did suggest that you know. Um, asking elected members to direct environment Canterbury staff to when they employ one person um, is it, 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 it isn't it isn't quite would you like to suggest what Ian has suggested yeah I mean it's just a, it's just a, a slight mm. modification I'm not going to support it anyway but no no you've made, you've made that very clear but what well, what what's the wording suggestion? yes let Ian. yeah Um, I was just going to suggest that instead of directing Environment Canterbury staff to reduce the rating burden, replace that with you consider reducing this additional rating burden. Okay. You just put it through right. as it is. We'll okay. leave it as it is. So, um, so we've got a um, we've got the it's been moved and seconded and the amendment has been moved and seconded so um, I'll open it up for debate and I'll have debate um, across the the two <coughs> yeah well, I, I kind of get the the gist of the wording without question but I, I think it's very hard for us to direct another organization staff and on so I do sympathize and uh, agree with the the sentiment but I can't support it with regards to directing others, and so. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify, because it possibly. No, no, no. It, we're in debate. No, I am. I'm just clarifying okay. what you were saying, and you're pa passive, sort of cheering around it. But when it says we would request, um, that's a, that's a consideration. That's not directing elected members at ECAN. That's saying we would request you to consider it. <laughs> so I, I don't really see why people would get wound up on it. I mean, th the whole point of this is that we've had public backlash over the fact that ECAN can't tighten their belt or aren't prepared uh, to drive greater operational efficiencies. And I think we should be, as a council, uh, sending some form of direction on behalf of the ratepayers of our constituencies who do raise it with us. I was at Avonhead Mall yesterday on our long-term plan who were concerned equally at um, some of the stuff we're doing, but also around ECAN. So I don't think it's unreasonable to put something like this to them. They can reject it. You know, We don't listen to every submission that comes through. Uh, we, certainly, we probably don't listen to most of them, but but you know, in, in the end, I think we can send our view uh, down. So I don't think this is unreasonable in the slightest. Andrew, uh, Sarah, Melanie. Thank you. Um, I think we need to take this in context. Um, yes, there's been quite a lot of publicity about it, around the 24% um, rates rise that ECAN are um, proposing. It is just a proposal. It's out for public consultation. Um, we know from the workshop we had with ECAN councillors that for Christchurch that means um, a 3% um, rates rise. 
Christchurch is the area that we should be considering. Our role is to represent the people of Christchurch, not to represent necessarily the people of all of Canterbury. Um, to, to quote something that somebody else might normally say in this room, 24% of what? We're coming off a low base. 24% of a mouse is not 24% of an elephant. Um, two very different things. Um, coming off a very, very low base. Um, but I think we should be concentrating on um, what the people of Christchurch would be interested in. I think um, a 3% rate rise on Christchurch, on Christchurch, particularly when we're considering in our own proposal a 5% rate rise ourselves. There is a hypocrisy in asking ECAN to reduce their 3% rate rise when we're proposing a rate rise higher than that of our own. Um, I also think um, we um, should be concerned with the reality rather than the perception. The 24% rate rise, yes, um, will apply to some, typically um, owners of rural properties, typically owners of large rural properties, typically owners of farms. Um, in areas well outside of our district. Um, I'm not in favour of this. I'm very comfortable with the position that we had taken as a council informally for those that were part of that discussion, um, which was that we wouldn't comment on the ECAN rate rise, and by return we're not expecting them to comment on ours. So I'm very comfortable with the position that we'd already taken in informal discussions between ourselves and um, Environment Canterbury, where those that were in the room were obviously able to um, take part in those discussions. Sarah. Kia ora. Um, I'll be voting against the amendment today and in favour of our uh, full submission as it stands, uh, because I'm really keen for us to have an outcomes and an environmental issues focus and the rates that fall out of that fall out of that when we, need, when we, look, out of, uh, our, when we look after our environment. I completely get that Councillor McDonald's residents may approach him upset about the rates increase, but residents are hosting meetings and protesting across our city on the issues they see at ECAN and the things that need addressing. They're holding meetings and protesting against the nitrates in the water across the region on air quality, both from quarries and from um, composting <laughs> in Bromley. Um, these are the things that people say they want from ECAN. They want them to enhance their... Um, monitoring, enhance their enforcement, and they're also wanting them to follow the new government standards on a range of things as well. This is what I'm hearing from residents who contact me, this is what I see on the social media feeds, and this is what I see from people actually gathering together and gathering a wider support base across the city in many meetings and protests, and also what we've heard today. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Melanie? Um, the same as Sarah, I'll be approving um, one and two and not the amendment. Um, look, I wanted actually to say um, that we supported option one and to make that clear, not to um, have any mention of the rates rise, but because of what option one that ECAN is presenting is trying to achieve, such as um, implementing um, you know, investment into things like the government's essential fresh water package, um, uh, wanting to put more into the public transport network space, increasing frequency and selected routes, moving to low and zero emission vehicles, etc. They also want to put more into biosecurity, environmental restoration, river works, um, and there's a whole, there's so much stuff that they want to do that if you do for option, if if we do if they do less then our environment will suffer and um, yeah so the fiscal restraint in terms of um, the environment you've got to weigh those two things up and I think the environment is way more important than a couple of dollars to everybody every week. Um, anyone else? I'll just, um, Aaron? Yeah, I, I will comment on this because I, I don't think this is rude. I think it's responsible that we uh, comment on the rates. Um, some people, and you, you can speak of the mouse all you want, but in my, some parts of my neighbourhood that's the size of a rat because um, we've got people paying more than two and a half grand, uh, four grand to ECAN in rates. Um, the irony is paying $1,500 a year for a bus that's two kilometres away is, uh, is, is an interesting subsidy. I, the, a 24% increase um, should alarm anyone. Uh, 
and as a council, it's our job, I think, to speak up. The fact that there was a, a secret meeting, or the, a, a meeting without the public, where a deal was done between the councils to not speak about it publicly, should raise people's eyebrows as well. Oh, did that not happen? Sorry, no. I'm just going to I'm just going to step in here because yep. I'm not having that sort of assertion being made. So, um, Sorry, I thought I heard that. No, so if you if, back, if you would like to reframe that right. to a workshop between council um, council laws and uh, council laws of Christchurch City Council and ECAN, as we meet with council laws of Waimakariri District Council as we meet with Selwyn District Council, but this was one with the environment. Canterbury councillors, and it did discuss both of our long-term plans. Yeah, okay, so uh, then, and obviously at that it was agreed that as a council we wouldn't speak about the rates rise, which um, no. No, it wasn't agreed. Maybe if you'd been yeah. there. I was at yeah, another meeting. Anyway, anyway, look, it's unhelpful, oh, really? Aaron, please. Okay, um, then uh, I'll just draw attention to uh, some of the rate rises. Um, like I saw in their chart that in 10 years' time, the spend on buses per year will be $150 million, which is a phenomenal uh, am amount of money. When uh, the increase, so you're going to more than double the spend on buses, but not double the patronage, because even our own staff said that the bus usage will only go up by 40%. So that there is a, um, essentially is an increase in the amount of carbon. I realise that buses will be switching to electric, but it's not certainly in the government's plan to have all vehicles electric by that time. Uh, and buses. they haven't, yeah, the buses might be, but it's $750,000 per bus. Uh, I don't think that's factored into their equations either. So um, we, it is our role to comment on our fellow councils. They can listen if they want but it is responsible for us to do that. And uh, at a time when inflation's incredibly low, uh, we should not be um, forcing infla uh, uh, faux inflation upon the economy by ramping up taxes, and this is another tax of 24%. And yes, it does come from a small base in some parts, but in other areas, it's not a small base. It's, it's an incredible amount of money. It's more than $1,000 for some households. Thank you. And um, I agree that it is our, our role to be responsible and to um, discuss and, and uh, converse with our fellow councils, but I also think it's important that we make informed comment about their work and what they're doing. Um, I think it's about respect. Uh, I haven't sat in the, in the chamber with my environmental um, by ECAN councillors and gone through the process that they've gone to to get to this point. And um, obviously we've heard that 24% is not the rate that's going to be um, applied to the uh, residents of the city. Um, so it's about respect, and I, I would expect the same back from them. We, they haven't sat with us through the hours and hours of, of combing through um, every line with our LTP. So it's up to the people of Christchurch to give that feedback to them, not us. Thank you. Mike. Thank you. Um, Look, I'll support the um, one and two, but not the amendment. And, and I guess, um, you know, it's always a little bit disappointing, I guess, when a number of councillors see a headline and run off to the media with their own wee, wee story of act actually getting proper information about the impact it has on Christchurch City um, people who were actually elected to represent. Had they got that information, perhaps some of this misinformation that continually goes into the media would have been correct. Uh, Yanni? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to pick up on the point that was made because we, we sat here earlier and heard deputations from people extremely concerned about the impact of quarries and the lack of responsiveness. I, I don't think we can really ask ECAN to do things and then say, actually, we want you to cut uh, funding towards those things. Um, probably the issue of PT, I mean, in our submission, we've actually talked about the fact that there is kind of a lack of visibility about where that, some of that money's going, and I do think that's actually a real missed opportunity. Um, we need a much bolder transport vision that transforms our public transport in the city if we want people to use it, and I, I just do personally feel that we're spending a lot of time on doing things that we've always done with slight tweaks rather than really big 
radical. And if you look at the rail that's going in up in Auckland, for example, um, I think there's a lot better systems that we should be looking at and considering. But fundamentally, um, you know, people actually want greater responsiveness from ECAN around protecting the environment, whether it's quarries, whether it's the organics plant, literally thousands and thousands of complaints go unanswered when it comes to our environment in our city because ECAN do not have the resourcing to respond. I want them to respond. I want them to actually look after the health of our environment for the sake of our community wellbeing. So I'm not going to support um, the, the amendment that's been put forward, but I do think we should always be encouraging um, organisations to consider carefully how they, how they spend money and to spend it in a wise and prudent fashion. But I don't think it's fair to ask for them to do more and then turn around and say, we want you to cut the funding. I just want to comment on the um, submission itself. I think it is really important um, that we do represent the interests of our uh, constituents, but we do have to make sure that what we do is within the bounds of what we can do. And I get utterly frustrated when I see really good people from the community who turn up here looking for a solution that we can't offer them because of the restrictions or the implications or the boundaries set by the Resource Management Act or by whatever um, functional separation there is between the different arms of government. So many things that people come here for that are the decision of central government, so many, as we've heard today, the, the purview of um, uh, the, the regional council. And I, it, it is frustrating that we end up having these debates around um, headlines and slogans instead of debating the real serious challenging issues that we have as a, as a city in the context of our regional council's long-term plan. This is a submission on their long-term plan. We've been asked to look at things like um, nitrates. Can you imagine what it would be like if nitrates were able to um, find their way into our aquifers? All of the chlorine in the world doesn't protect us from nitrates. Can you imagine what the position of this city will be when a future council has to deal with the nitrates in the system, within the aquifer system, that is then um, uh, meaning that it has to be extracted in some, in some way before it can be delivered at all. So all I'm saying is, is that there are serious issues that we do need to have to front up to. There are matters within our own LTP which will generate significant debate and we have to debate them maturely and sensibly but focusing on one aspect of it, a headline story doesn't cut the mustard. It isn't what we are elected to do, it isn't what the Local Government Act requires us to do. We are required to think for the current generation but also for future generations as well. And there are decisions that we are making now that will have an impact on decisions in the future. It is the same for ECAN. Let them make the decision around the rates implications of the final LTP that they sign off on and let us make the decision about the rates impact of the final LTP that we sign off on. So on that note, I will put the amendment. Um, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Can you put up your hands? It's probably easier. Goff to McDonald um, Major um, and Kewan. Kewan. <laughs> and um, uh, that's those that's lost. And um, I oh sorry sorry those those opposed say no. No. <laughs> that's lost. Um, and. Uh, I will put the full motion. Um, those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. That's carried. And it, the same people oppose yeah, making submissions no. on yeah, all just those issues. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, put up your hand for no. <laughs> Same. 
same thing. No, no, that people will be interested. Yep, thank you. Right. Yeah, same. So that is carried. So thank you. It's a million dollars for trees in there. Yes. And uh, so the last thing that I'm going to do before we adjourn for uh, lunch is to um, move that the public be excluded for the um, items on the agenda. There is no one that needs to be included, is there? No. No, and the um, agenda uh, sets out the reasons for. Um, I'll move that, seconded by Pauline Cotter. Um, any discussion? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's aye. carried. We will, oh, and opposed is Yanni. And um, we will now adjourn for lunch and we'll be back here at 2 pm. Thank you.